Could you please call roll? Jimenez? Present. Corrales? Here. Cohen? Here. Roscoe? Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Foley? Here. Mahan? Here. Jones? Present. Licardo? Present. I have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, we'll call the meeting to order then for the afternoon of April 6th. Uh, let's begin. If you're able to please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United States, States of America. America and to the Republic, the Republic for which it just stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. For today's invocation, we're pleased to have Jenlyn Nguyen, the director of EM Collective with us, and Councilmember Cohen will tell us more. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to welcome Jennifer, uh, Jenlyn Nguyen to our uh, meeting today. Um, Jenlyn is the founder of EM Collective, which is a group originally founded to assist locally owned Asian and women owned businesses with marketing and media production. Uh, with the dramatic increase in hostility towards Asians, she and EM Collective have shifted their focus and purpose, currently operating as an organization that provides personal alarms, resources, and training to help protect the Asian community. She's an entrepreneur, activist, advocate, and very proud to be a product of the Bay Area. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Thank you, David, for the introduction. Um, hi, I'm Jenna Nguyen, and I'm the founding member of M Collective. Today, I'd like to read you an invocation written by us, the M Collective leadership, as a way to remind ourselves to keep moving forward. Imagine what it's like to not know the next day when you leave your house. You can be killed and not return back to your family. Imagine what it's like to know that your family member won't come back alive. Imagine your government, your people not wanting to protect you. So you have to flee and you have to flee in the desperate way possible. That was the last time my parents would see their home country. They were refugees escaping oppression and all they wanted was to live in a safe place that would allow them to carve out a moderately successful lives for themselves and provide for their children. You might think I'm telling the story of my parents, perhaps the story of my family members or members of my community. You couldn't be blamed for assuming that the experience described is unique. History has a way of eroding the details of pain, minimizing the effects of live trauma, and all but erasing the severity of the struggle endured. That is why too few of us consciously realize how much we share. One or two or five generations back, each of our lineage is defined and shaped by a similar experience and thus the cycle is created and perpetrated. We hide from our pain instead of expressing it. We shroud our experiences in shame instead of embracing them. We allow trauma to create fear instead of confronting and not realizing that by confronting, we can harness strength from it. In this moment, let us begin a new cycle, a new legacy of generations beyond us. Let us teach them to share with each other let us speak to them to the, of the perils of silence and the promise of unity. Let us fight past our trauma so that we may arm them with the knowledge to do the same. And let us not act out of fear, but out of courage. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna, for your words. <clears throat> All right, uh, we're on now to orders of the day. Um, there are, there is one new item, which is item uh, 2.14. It's approval or proclamation for arts, culture, and creativity month because there was no rules committee last week. Um, is there a motion to include this along with other items? Motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, let's vote then on orders of the day. And Jenna, thank you so much for joining us. Please let us know how we can be supportive of your efforts. Menes? Yes. Morales? Aye. 
Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Roscoe? Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Under the closed session report, um, Nora. Thank you, Mayor. Um, there was nothing to report today out of closed session. Thank you. The consent calendar uh, is next. Uh, are there items that the uh, council would like to pull? I know that staff will be pulling item 2.14, which is a approval of proclamation for arts, culture, and creativity month. Uh, are there other items? Uh, Council Member Foley. Mayor, I'd like to pull 2.6, report from liaison to the retirement boards. Okay. And Council Member Davis. 2.9, please. Okay. Uh, any other items? Okay, let's start then with item 2.6, which is the report from liaisons to the retirement boards. Council Member Foley. Thank you. Just briefly, we had a retirement board meeting last week for the police and fire retirement board, and I wanted to report the pension plan has returned 17.5% fiscal year to date, and the health plan has returned 18.27% fiscal return uh, to date. Their target is 6.25, so uh, this benefits from the uh, great market that we've had over the last year. Also, the trustees discussed asset uh, allocations as they do every year, and they uh, like to stay within a target of 6.25. Being concerned about risk is they're very risk averse at the in the uh, retirement boards, as you can imagine, and they approved an asset allocation of 70% equity and 30% to growth. That concludes my report. Thank you. And thank you for that really great news. <laughs> it's the first time I've heard a really positive report about returns on the funds in many years. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilman Davis, did you want to add anything before we go to the public? Sorry, not for 2.6. No, just 2.9. Okay. Yeah, understood. Uh, Mr. Soda, did you want to comment on 2.6, the report uh, from the retirement committees? Uh, no, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I wanted to uh, 2.14. Okay, we'll come back to you then. Thank you. Um, all right, then. Uh, next up uh, is, uh, and we'll take all these in a motion at the end here, uh, item 2.9, which is the annual development in lieu fee report. Council Member Davis. Thank you. Just a question for staff. Um, the anticipated full funding collection on the um, in lieu undergrounding master plan is 2040. It looked like at, for every <laughs> every item, is that a real number or is that just, we're not sure, so we just put it out 20 years? Yeah. And I'm not sure who who's uh, who that question should go to, Dave. Yeah, I, I think it would normally go to Matt and see if... Uh... Matt Kano is on or someone from his staff. I think Matt's out this week. Yeah. I know this question's been asked in the past, and I, I believe what you suspect is right, uh, Councilmember Davis, that this is a placeholder. So my further question then, I see Jay's coming on. Thank you, Council Member and uh, uh, Mayor. Uh, sorry, just being let in as a panelist. Uh, so your question is the full amount for the in lieu fee. I also yeah. have Sal Kumar on the line. If you need to yeah, the anticipated full funding collection is 2040 for all of them. Is that just like a shot in the dark? No, that isn't a shot in the dark. It is based on our five-year and 10-year plans for those fees, uh, which the report uh, provides and what's been accomplished and what we aim to collect enough to accomplish. And let me see if Sal Kumar will be able to join us with further details. Sal. Councilman Davis, this is Sal Kumar, Public Works. Uh, the number 240 is based on the uh, 2040 plan. It is the anticipated number, um, but it's, it's just a number there, the date there. Um, 
but yeah, it, it, it is like, like Jay mentioned that uh, we try to get our, all the projects accomplished based on the five year work plan, but that 2040 number is just a number in there based on the 2040 general plans. Okay, because yeah, thank you. I appreciate that because whether they're 56% funded or 0.2% funded, they all say 2040. The only one that I see now, there's one that says 2020, but it's 96% funded. And that would that was last year. So I'm guessing that might not be happen. But my uh, further question then is, is there a way maybe to flip this where we could bond for this and actually do the undergrounding and and have the developers fees pay for it, pay for the bonds, so that we can actually do this work? We, we can look further into that idea on how to uh, get the capital through one tool or another, working with the developers. I mean, we always engage developers to encourage uh, them to potentially do the work so we don't have to wait these five and 10 year cycles, if not even longer, to accomplish the undergrounding. Um, moreover, we're always looking to partner with uh, the Rule 20A, 20B to, to leverage uh, so long as the CPUC and uh, pg e have that funding uh, available so we can leverage that get the capital together with the development projects and and execute to get the undergrounding um so we're, we're open to exploring uh the possibility of, of bonding and happy to follow up with you further yeah i just think it, it i mean there are certain areas of the city that are um more prone to wildfires and it seems like this is a resiliency issue for some some of those areas where if we could bond and underground do the work and and have the developers who come in after that pay it pay it back that maybe that maybe that's a way that we could flip it where we could actually get the work done it was just it's just a thought but that's something that you know we've been talking about resiliency and talking about the the issues with the grid and when this came up i, I was thinking about you know the areas of the city that are um, at risk for wildfire and the fact that we don't want those, you know, it, it might be in our interest and PG&E's interest to get those undergrounded sooner rather than later. Yeah, actually, council members, I think staff, we can kind of look at that, you know, I think historically the bottleneck has been establishing the districts through the, the process, the PG&E process, but uh, later in the year or sometime other in the year, we, we have our undergrounding report that's, that is kind of more comprehensive than just the in lieu fee report. So maybe we can kind of, when we come back with that report, take a look at, at uh, options for supplemental funding for, for the capital and the program. So thank you. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Any other questions? And Dave, I just had a question about you know, many years ago, I remember we had a lot of conversation about how we could actually <clears throat> uh, merge the um, allocations along different street segments uh, to be able to actually get shovels in the ground on some of these projects. And I was told that there was some change in law that would allow us to start doing that. And I was under the impression that we were doing it to some extent, some limited extent. Is, is that right? Yeah, I'll ask maybe Sal to jump in because a lot has changed in, with the program since I was more directly involved. I know for several years we were having an issue with, with the standard agreement that, that was being required of us, but I think we've gotten past that hurdle and I think there is more flexibility in the program now. So either Jay or Sal. Hi, Dave, this is Sal Kumar again. So as far as the, the 20 pro a program, which is PG&E utility company funded pro program is still the law is still the same. Okay. Um, it hasn't changed much. It's just the challenges we're having with utility companies implementing these projects because it's not a priority for them. Um, the 20B program in Luffy program, uh, developer funded projects um, are uh, um, implemented once the majority of the fees are collected. We have done combined projects, 20A, 20B projects, where we can you know, leverage one of the other program to do a larger project. So that's what we have been doing. Okay, but we're not... For example, I see, for example, a segment of Monterey Road is 75% complete. And I think most of us would say, hey, well, let's go grab some money from some of the other segments, keep the money, you know, keep an accounting of the fact that we're borrowing from some other street uh, and at least get Monterey undergrounded. 
And so, Sal, I'm just trying to understand, are you saying that the law does not allow that, us to do that? Or it does, but there are problems with the utilities? Um, it does, actually, as a matter of fact, we, the, the fund that we collect, it goes in, into a pot. And, um, and we do the project where um, there's a capital project uh, or a 28 project for Monterey Road. And that's a good, good one that we'll be, it's the same, well, we're doing a 28 project there. However, there has been, fees has been collected in the area. So, um, so yeah, we have been, we've been doing that uh, using uh, money from the pot, the in uh, program funding and doing projects where uh, majority of the fees have been collected or we have a 28 project adjacent to it um, or there's a capital project, so. Okay. So we are doing some of that borrowing from other uh, sub funds in other streets. Um, Correct. Okay. Yeah, Mayor, and I think just as with Council Member Davis's question, we do come forward annually with an undergrounding, an annual undergrounding report. Yep. This is just the in lieu fee piece of it. Got it. So that other report is more comprehensive on, on the overall programmatic you know, objectives. And so maybe then we can kind of revisit some of these questions and, and get some uh, comprehensive answers for you. Okay, sounds good. All right, thank you. Then um, let's move forward then to item uh, 2.14, <clears throat> which is uh, the approval of proclamation for arts, culture, and creativity month. I believe Carrie Adams Hapner, uh, I'm sorry, Council Member Foley. I'll call in after the presentation. Okay. If there is one. Welcome, Carrie. Hi, good, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. It's a pleasure to see you today. Um, I'm here to express my appreciation for your support of our Arts and Culture Creativity Month in San Jose. So in recognition of the contribution of arts and creativity and the quality of that it makes in the quality of our life every day, the state of California proclaimed April every year going forward as Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month. So here in San Jose, we want to do the same. And in, in, in coordination with this statewide initiative, the San Jose Office of Cultural Affairs, alongside 27 arts organizations, businesses, community groups, and artists, we have celebrated the launch of a new virtual festival called We Create 408. We Create 408 is a month long challenge designed to inspire creativity and celebrate San Jose. Over 1,500 people have signed up to participate so far, and we're inviting all of you. I know that Councilmember Mahan has already participated. Thank you. You're great this weekend. And so we invite you and all of your constituents to sign up at wecreate408.org and take the creativity challenge because creativity infuses everything we do every day, whether it's cooking or gardening, or putting those Easter baskets together, or putting on your clothes, or making art, or singing, or whatever it is. Art and creativity and culture is for you. And we have so many great partners, including today, our partner is the School of Arts and Culture at Mexican Heritage Plaza. So we are asking people to upload and hashtag, we create for our weight, and and share what are their cultural traditions that they want to share with each other that bring a sense of connection to themselves, to their community, and to this great city. So with that, I just want to thank all of our partners. I also want to thank the Packard Foundation for their ongoing support of the We Create 408 program. And I also want to just ask everybody to celebrate creativity in their everyday lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, Council Member Foley. Thank you. I was so excited to see this on the agenda today. It's so important that we acknowledge our arts, our culture, and our creativity. And I love We Create San Jose. I don't know that I'll, I don't know what I'll do. I'll support the creativity. How about that? But I, you know, in this pandemic who has struggled as much as our restaurants and our small businesses and others is our artists. 
our artists, particularly our performing artists, have not been able to get out there and perform in the way that they normally do. They don't have a live audi audience. Our theater camps, our kids who do perform, our bands, our uh, performers all over the city are not able to do what they need to do to really feel enriched and excited about their community. I know everywhere we are, if you're in a neighborhood, uh, many neighborhoods have backyard or front yard garage bands who are actually playing in the garage, opening their doors so the neighbors can hear their music. But please go out, no, do, do some creativity, be artistic, but go out and support the artists in any way that you possibly can. Whatever moves you, please support our artists. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilmember Foley. Uh, there's one thing I wanted to just mention and add is that we have a virtual kickoff event happening in this Thursday, which is on April 8th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And there will be some online uh, virtual programming where you can learn how to make prints. There'll be things in different languages. So we just invite all of our residents of San Jose to come get creative and enjoy and connect with each other. So thank you so much for your support and, and this proclamation. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for all that you and your team uh, do uh, to help spur our creativity and, and particularly to all of our uh, creative partners, the many arts organizations that have struggled mightily, we know, over the last year and a half that are so essential to us in our daily lives and particularly in this recovery. Um, Mr. Sodio. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to extend a, a, a my gratitude to Senora Hepner for um, for doing what you could to to uh, uh, bring this to the fore for the city to uh, to enjoy and rally around. I participated in a workshop that uh, Elizabeth Montenegro gave at the Mexican Heritage Plaza for Cesar Chavez's birthday. It was a writing, it was a poetry uh, uh, workshop, and it it comes out of your office. And so that was it, it was it was really cool to connect with with other writers. And 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 connect with the legacy, because the Chicano had we create for a way, but we called it the lowrider movement. You see, the lowrider movement and all of that creativity that comes out of the oppression, Salsi Puedes was just as oppressive and killed just as many people, if not more, than COVID because of the pesticides. And so, what the Chicano has always been challenged to do is to is to reach within himself and to transform that which has oppressed him and use it as the means by which will, that that will give him strength, that that will give him hope, and that will give him the ability to see that he does have a place in the society. And we put, we, put, we put San Jose on the map worldwide. You saw the creativity, and these are all the sons and daughters of campesinos from Salsi Puedes, all of them. Every single person that was involved in the lowrider movement here were sons and daughters of campesinos. And you want to talk about beauty. You want to talk about creativity, art. And in fact, us, from a spiritual perspective, we are the reflections of the creator himself. He created us in his image. That's why when we're sitting down and we're creating something beautiful that impacts the life of another human being viscerally, that's why he, he created us with that ability. And we're actually reflecting him when we engage in the creative process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sheriff. All right, any other comments? Uh, Council Member Reyes. Thank you. I also wanted just to say thank you to Carrie for supporting our artists throughout all of San Jose. I know that we had some special um, events in our district in which we, um, well, we attempted to paint the electrical boxes, although there was some wonderful local uh, artists who came in afterwards who were there the whole time, um, but helped us uh, brush up on those uh, images. And so they looked just absolutely fabulous every time we passed by. And these were the kind of small things that we could do as a community with you know, appropriate spacing. Um, but these kinds of outlets uh, allowed us to con uh, connect and to celebrate and um, and just to you know really 
enjoy each other's uh, company, which is ultimately, I think, what art does is it allows us to reflect, it allows us to um, celebrate and, um, and also express our pain, right? Um, so I, I appreciate that. And I wonder if we are going to also continue to connect with our neighborhood associations because our neighborhood associations are sometimes uh, a parent's outlet. <laughs> We've been doing crafts um, once a week, at one of my neighborhood associations, this last time they did um, sock bunnies, um, kind of in preparation for Easter. Not everybody celebrated, but I think everybody loves an, uh, a bunny uh, a, a sock. Anyways, I, I was hoping to hear whether you were thinking about including or if any of these organizations included neighborhood associations. Thank you, Councilmember Arenas, and I love that. I just love what you just shared with us. We invite everybody to participate. So if there are council, uh, if there are neighborhood associations with whom we can do some direct outreach towards, please, we will reach out. Let's like, let's connect. Let's make sure that they have the information they need, that they know how to sign on. But essentially, we create 408.org is a website log on you can get a social media prompt and just start getting creative but we will love to do extensive outreach i will absolutely advertise we have a volunteer event this uh, month so i will absolutely advertise and encourage everybody to participate thank you so much thank you mm -hmm. all right any other comments excellent uh let's vote then if there i uh, know we won't vote we'll have a motion first <laughs> if someone could please I'll move to make adoption a motion. consent calendar second thank you councilmember cohen uh, second councilmember foley now let's vote Menes? yes Morales. aye cohen aye crosco davis aye esparza yes arenas Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Lucardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, we're on to item 3.1, which is the report of our city manager, Dave. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we do have a report today. Um, as normal, I'll start off with our unsung heroes. Uh, today, we are honoring uh, Sabi Kaur and Mimi Christian Nguyen as our unsung heroes. Uh, Sabi has been co-lead uh, co of the Language Access Unit in the EOC since March 2020, and then Mimi joined her as co-lead in August of, of 2020, and both have successfully and gracefully managed hundreds of translation and interpretation requests with extremely fast turnaround times uh, so that our Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese-speaking residents um, have timely access to critical information. Um, and uh, they, of course, they've done this while, while working simultaneous uh, emergencies such as COVID and wildfires. Um, Mimi is a certified interpreter whose language skills help us connect with our Vietnamese community in both her role in the OC and also her job as a crime prevention specialist in, uh, in the police department. Uh, Sabi and Mimi coordinate with the professional translation vendors and also bilingual staff throughout the entire city organization who serve as part of the EOC's uh, language access unit uh, to make sure that messaging to, to our San Jose community um, is accurate and culturally responsive. Um, they both advocate tirelessly for bilingual staff who they work with uh, in the entire organization. As a member of the Office of Immigrant Affairs, Sabi is deeply committed to the immigrant community that she serves on a, on a daily basis. Both of these unsung heroes uh, really approach their jobs as a labor of love. They're both deeply and personally committed to communicating with our residents who are unable to engage with us, the city, in English. And so we're super lucky to have uh, Sabi and Mimi in our workforce and very grateful to them for all the work they've been doing over the past year, so thank you. Mm -hmm. So next, we will jump into our presentation um, and COVID update, and I'm going to pass it off to uh, Lee. Thank you, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Council, 
uh, members of the public, Emily Wilcox, Deputy City Manager, along with Kip Harkness, one of the directors of our Emergency Operations Center. Today, we'll be presenting on a few different things. First, we'll provide uh, some brief updates on activities uh, undertaken by the city's EOC, the county's shift to the orange, the, the state's orange tier, and, a, and an update on an announcement that the governor made at noon today, as well as updates around the vaccination status in our county. And then lastly, we're going to talk about uh, the city's shift and our community shift from one of uh, response phase in our comprehensive um, emergency management philosophy to one of recovery, um, where I'll be joined by our director of Office of Emergency, Ma or emergency Management, Ray Reardon, to talk about some of the logistics around that. We do practice comprehensive emergency management into the in the city, and one of those, uh, uh, that is a framework uh, for responsibility and readiness across all different hazards, as well as all phases of the emergency management cycle. Um, one of those important characteristics is closing the links between our mitigation, our preparedness, our response, and our recovery. Um, and so we'll go over that today. A majority of the last 14 months for our city, we have uh, spent in a response phase, one that lasted longer than we could have foreseen. And so the shifts of resources, our community and personnel from one of response to recovery will take planning and coordination uh, throughout the organization and throughout the community. But for now, with our response and turning our attention to our COVID-19 response, here in the United States, we've lost over 550,000 people to this disease uh, as of yesterday, including nearly 2,000 locally, with some 100 patients currently in our hospital struggling with COVID-19. The economic effects of this pandemic continue along with the continued high unemployment rate, as well as economic distress, all of which dis disproportionately impact our Black, Latinx, Native American individuals, communities across the nation and here in San Jose. This past month, the EOC has continued to focus on those most in need and the critical tasks. And just to highlight a few of these, this past uh, uh, month in March, a total of 240 new volunteers were signed up through Silicon Valley Strong to assist with food distribution, as well as vaccine outreach. 106, uh, 160 of these volunteers have been trained and taken the disaster service oath um, uh, worker to help with our vaccine, our vaccine outreach um, in support of the county. We've also, with our emergency rental assistant team, since this item was in front of council on March 23rd, have reached agreement with the state of California regarding the program and its alignment to the state and local programs. We've also reached out to 360 small businesses as of March uh, 26 in the Little Saigon, Grand Century Mall, Capitol and Tully, and Story and White Road areas in collaboration with Council District 7, Council District 5 staff with the purpose of providing information on economic relief and recovery programs and establishing ongoing communications. In addition, the Rock and Learn waiver process is near complete. Our final inspections at all locations across the city will be done this week and registration for summer programming set to open for scholarship eligibility families will open on April 19th. Lastly, over the past 30 days, the Beautify SJ team have removed 117 tons of trash off of our streets and servicing 225 active encampments across the city. Following the states of California's announcement that Santa Clara County has met the requirements to move into the orange tier of the state's blueprint for a safer economy, the county and um, the County of Santa Clara's health officer announced that the county would align with the state's framework and allow activities in the orange tier to resume effective Wednesday the 23rd. These activities um, uh, constitute changes in indoor dining, retail stores with modification, gyms and fitness centers, movie theaters, family entertainment centers, as well as zoos, museums, and aquariums. I do wanna thank all of our community partners, the county, our emergency um, operations center PIO team, as well as all the council offices with helping communicate this information out and the changing circumstances to our residents and to our businesses. 
Lastly, as of noon today, the governor announced that the state's next step in the COVID-19 pandemic recovery uh, would begin to move forward and the state will be reopened by June 15th if two critical or two criteria are met. The first is if vaccine supply is sufficient for Californians 16 years and older who wish to be vaccinated. And second, hospitalization rates are stable and low. Again, this came out at noon today and as the uh, plan was just released, we will continue to analyze this, get additional information and communicate out directly to the council and the community in the coming days. Moving on to vaccines, as we all know, and has well been documented in the media and through various uh, outlets, vaccine supplies continue to be a major constraint in our county's ability to administer more vaccines to residents who are currently and newly eligible. Based on the current estimates, uh, the state of, Calif state of California officials believe um, to be allocated approximately 2.5 million first and second doses in the first half of April per week, um, while that amount will grow to over 3 million doses in the second half of April. However, California currently is receiving less than 2 million doses per week, roughly 1.8 million, with these numbers adjusting slightly as week to week. Um, this is in, uh, uh, not in alignment with what the state has built out as their system with a capacity of doing 3 million doses per week right now with planning to administer 4 million doses per week by the end of April. Even locally, we've seen the same effects. This, uh, this week, our, our county doses increased to nearly 72,000 doses, which is up from 58,000. But as Dr. Marty Fenstersheib said last week that that's not enough. It's literally one third of the county's capacity right now as the county's healthcare system has capacity to administer 200,000 doses per week right now. Yet even the smaller allocation um, has proven difficult for the county um, with having to balance administering first dose appointments with those who are eligible with prioritizing some of our most vulnerable communities while also assuring enough second dose appointments available for those um, that have received their first dose. As of April 1st, the county released 32,000 appointments for people 50 and older that are now eligible. However, the county, or the, the county cautions that Santa Clara County has upwards of over 400,000 residents that are between the ages of 50 and 60. Uh, and while having to continue getting uh, vaccinations uh, to eligible populations that were uh, previously um, in the expansion, the county continues to get a fraction of the numbers, so availability of appointments uh, will continue to be a challenge. We still have a long way to go, especially since April uh, 15th of this month, uh, vaccines will be eligible for anyone 16 years and older who wish to be vaccinated. As things continue to change uh, in this dynamic space, the city will continue to prioritize advocating for our vulnerable communities and to ensure that they have access and are not left behind. And I'll come back to that subject a little bit later in the presentation. So as I mentioned before, for the last 14 months or year, everyone's been in response mode. Um, as we uh, detailed in a study session before the pandemic with the mayor and council, um, a tabletop exercise around uh, the emergency operations center and how it functions, Responses usually uh, comprise of uh, coordination and management of resources, including personnel, equipment, and supplies, and in all hazards, earthquake, man-made, or a global pandemic. And measures are taken to protect life, property, Lee, and environmental safety. I think you're one slide ahead for us just to, to get us on sync. Sorry to interrupt your flow. Am I? Well, there you go. <laughs> I'm overly eager. Thank you, Kip. <laughs> <laughs> You're a step ahead. That's all. Yes, and we actually have art on this slide, which should be shown and not skipped. So, um, so we are going to start our shift into the recovery process within emergency management. In our cycles, uh, recovery um, does overlap with the response, and it consists of those activities that continue beyond an emergency period. Um, to restore critical community functions and begin to manage stabilization efforts. The recovery phase ramps up 
after a response is done and the threat to human life has subsided. Uh, the goal of the recovery process is to bring those affected areas and people back to some degree of normalcy, including essential services, any physical repair, and community and economic damages. Everyone is eager for recovery with the vaccines now beginning to be administered and hopefully ramping up soon, recovery uh, has come into view for many. The community and economic challenges emerging in the wake of COVID-19 have been well-documented and appear daunting. Therefore, our recovery planning needs to be focused and begin now. For us to get to full-blown recovery and for us to fully step into that space, there's two important elements, getting vaccines, for everyone in our community who want them and starting to transition our organization and resources to those roadmap uh, activities identified as part of the recovery process. So first moving to community recovery. Community recovery is highly dependent on vaccination success. And so as we've talked about in previous uh, council meetings and 3.1 presentations, our role in this vaccination um, success really hinders on our advocacy and our partnership in advocacy to ensure equitable uh, scale and speed, adding capacity to the system, whether it's with the county um, or federal, state, and hospital partners, and then mobilizing and engaging um, our residents to get vaccinated. Our work in this space um, continues uh, to be a priority for us. I want to mention a few different things that is going on now. Um, and we'll dive into some of these individually. Around advocacy, we're working hard to advocate for our community to receive equi the equity-based allocation from the state. Some of the work this past month that we've engaged in is supporting and advocating alongside the County of Santa Clara, as well as other Bay Area counties and other nonprofits to ensure that vulnerable communities highly impacted by COVID-19 have equitable access to vaccination. We have contributed our own analysis and local population statistics to letters that have been sent to the state and the governor and the legislature. And we are ensuring that vulnerable communities aren't left behind by the state's distribution plan. We've also uh, sent dozens of letters uh, to various state officials um, and have been on call with the county um, to take advocacy um, actions when requested by the county. Um, while advocating for higher access for vaccine supply, um, we also are working to in enhance and strengthen the local capacity of the system. And this work has involved our mutual aid staffing with the county, continuing to vac uh, vaccinate eligible employees at the first um, responder clinic at the fairgrounds and supporting the county with in-home vaccination. Some of the work this past month has included partnering with Kaiser to get more vaccinations in highly vulnerable, highly impacted communities. Um, Kaiser's currently operating a vaccination clinic at the Vietnamese American Cultural Center with a commitment to vaccinate all eligible populations, especially those in the surrounding area. As of yesterday, 150 of our uh, EMTs and uh, paramedics in the San Jose Fire Department have been trained through the injection training program to build capacity to support the, counties, the county and our healthcare. Uh, partners, and I'll speak about that later. And lastly, we are continuing to support and mobilize and engage efforts to get shots in arms. And this is include conducting broad communications campaign as well as very targeted uh, outreach and communications campaign um, around specific sites. We've been able to reach over 8,000 residents in the last month, and I'll dive into some of these activities now. As I mentioned, adding capacity is a key tenant of our economic recovery. And to support this, we've partnered with several federal, state, and local entities, in addition to our healthcare partners, uh, to help uh, vaccinate our vulnerable communities. Uh, with Aki, we've worked um, with this federally qualified uh, healthcare center, specializing in delivery um, of support services with three large areas, uh, three large events, vaccinating uh, roughly 1,000 people in the last month. And as I've mentioned with Kaiser Permanente, we are operating a community-wide center, not exclusively for Kaiser patients, I should say, um, at the v Vietnamese Cultural Center. Um, we are starting with capacity for 500 vaccinations per day with the intent to scale as supply increases. 
and our teams are working hard um, to ensure availability of Vietnamese, Spanish speaking staff and language access materials and information and all materials are abundant at this site. We're also working um, as of yesterday, we're uh, to support the county's public health department with our own fire department personnel with the county's in-home um, uh, mobile vaccination program. Uh, San Jose fire staff will be carrying out in-home vaccinations in the following zip codes, 95116, 113, 127, 122, and 121. This program vaccinates in-home or uh, homebound individuals as defined by Medicare. The county currently has oversight of this program and we're supporting this um, with our injectors through San Jose Fire. As uh, the county has communicated to us that this program will uh, expand and scale as additional supply of the vaccine, vaccine continues to grow in the county. Also with the county, we continue to work uh, towards providing the county uh, with staff um, to bolster capacity at several of the county vaccination sites throughout San Jose. San Jose is exploring um, options to both recruit and use appropriate um, staff or part-time staff within the city to do this as we've talked with you. Um, as we start to reopen um, and move through the orange tier, some of our own employees that are um, currently on staff will be redeployed back to services that are opening up um, um, in our own city. So we're placing special emphasis on the second phase. And so um, we have been advertising for positions that we would hire and then send to the county to add capacity at our site. Thanks several of the council offices for getting word out. Um, those are full-time positions. Um, we're requiring people that are fluent in Spanish, Vietnamese, Mandarin, people with excellent customer service skills and people that can start as soon as possible and work through the end of June. Uh, the posting has been up for two weeks and hundreds of people have applied and we're working out final details and a memorandum of understanding with the county now. And lastly, um, we are supporting with logistics targeted outreach for several mobile COVID-19 clinics that the county will be hosting in the coming weeks. Mobilizing engages our hardest, our hardest hit communities is our last body of work. Um, within uh, this program. As I mentioned before, we are doing extensive lit drops in some of our hard hit census tracts around Eastridge and vaccination locations with, uh, throughout Eastside uh, with collateral in all relevant languages. We've been utilizing Project HOPE staff and other community services staff to support these efforts as well as leveraging existing outreach activities to share uh, vaccine info when possible. And we're providing resource kit with messages to protect San Jose, information on how to get vaccinated, as well as resources um, at our virtual local assistance center page, um, hand sanitizer, and any hand notes that they need. Lastly, here are some examples of our mobilization uh, work has looked like, and we've done some extensive canvassing, as I mentioned, for very specific vaccination events, as well as vaccination, uh, vaccination sites. Uh, these activities have been in multi-language and have reached thousands of our most vulnerable residents. Um, you know, it should be noted, um, this targeted approach has shown very positive results, when we, you know, compared to the rest of the county dashboard. Um, and so we have been in conversations with the county as the, the um, access to vaccine continues to increase, hopefully in the coming weeks, that we will be in a support role of additional uh, mobile place-based um, targeted outreach for some of our affected areas. Um, already we're working uh, with Safeway, Sutter Health, and Aki again for some of our uh, mobile events and mobile sites in the coming uh, month, and hopefully we'll have more on the way with the county. So one of the, the second part of our presentation is, is how we transition our organization to recovery and start planning. Um, and moving our community from recovery, um, uh, our approach is dependent, or moving our organization is dependent on advancing three concurrent buckets. Ensuring vaccinations for our employees are accessible, funding for recovery, or more specifically, aligning possible funding sources to community and organizational needs is done. And then lastly, demobilizing our emergency response. 
Um, and of course, this will occur over several months um, as we step into the recovery phase. For our own employees, as we reported out last month, um, many have become eligible um, with the state and county guidelines to receive their vaccination. We've completed all PD and fire sworn personnel who wanted to get vaccinated. Um, and we've started vaccinating non-sworn city employees who are eligible um, as of February 25th. Um, as uh, eligibility continues to increase and the county has kept the first responder clinic open um, at the fairgrounds, we've been able to push over 800 employees to get their first doses um, uh, at that site. And we continue through the Emergency Operations Center, Human Resources Department and Office Employee Relations to ensure all field personnel working in the Emergency Operations Center or providing essential services in the field um, are prioritized through this process. Turning to funding, a uh, little bit of a recap, but since the beginning of the pandemic, Congress has passed six different COVID stimulus packages, with the most recent being the $1.9 trillion package uh, entitled the American Rescue Plan. At a state level, the legislature has approved more than $13 billion in COVID uh, response funding uh, through budget actions earlier this year, or early budget actions, and we anticipate additional money through the regular budget process from the state as well. Um, as a city, we've used equity as a, a primary driver for how our emergency relief funding is prioritized and programmed to help the most vulnerable. Um, so too does equity drive our future advocacy efforts surrounding implementation and guidance and securing additional funding. As we look forward, we have two major advocacy buckets. First being uh, the different funding pots within the American Rescue Plan. As federal agencies begin to implement this plan, we will need to ensure that San Jose and our communities in greatest need have funding. Some near-term opportunities include the rollout, um, which just happened of the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, Broadband Program, local, assist, uh, local fiscal recovery funds, and all of the different guidance um, that uh, federal departments will be laying out. The second involves a projected $40 billion surplus um, at the state, uh, 26 billion of which is the state's share of the American Rescue Plan. And we're working with several different uh, coalitions, including the League of Cities and big city mayors to dedicate a significant portion of this surplus to our local homeless programs. There are a host of other opportunities um, in this area that we are engaging on related to childcare funding, low uh, income water assistance funding and emergency rental housing programs, just to name a few. And lastly, um, and importantly, uh, the city is about halfway through with our uh, mapping exercise to identify additional funding sources to pressing city needs. The city staff and our Ernst & Young consultants are building a funding matrix to match city needs and city direction to uh, alternative funding sources. Our intention is to review, uh, pursue these alternative funding sources so the city preserves our American Rescue Plan funding, um, which should be the most flexible and used as a backstop uh, for addressing city revenues lost um, over the past year due to the COVID-19 pandemic and protect the general fund and ongoing services for residents who need them the most. We'll continue to update the mayor and council as additional federal departments working on guidance, release that um, guidance. And I'll come back to the budget process and, and how we will move forward with that at the end of the presentation. For our last bucket and how we will start to demobilize our emergency response, I'd like to turn it over to our director of our Office of Emergency Management, Ray Ruda. Good afternoon. You think I know how to do this after a year, but this is the mute button. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ray Reardon, the director of the City Manager's Office of Emergency Management. Uh, and as Lee's been identifying, uh, this, we are moving into our demobilization phase. And as you also described the diagram you see here, emergency management is a cycle of five phases. Prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And that continues that cycle going for each hazard that we face. Within each phase, there are detailed standard activities. For response, one of the ongoing activities is to assess 
the ongoing threat or risk. This is also known as situational assessment. As a risk or threat increases, you add resources and adjust your action plan. In the same way, as the risk reduces, you reduce the resources and readjust your action plans. We did a great job of building up resources to the EOC in the field when the emergency was at its height. We had as many as 730 people reporting to the EOC. Now, as the situation appears to be improving, we have to be just as smart and plan our reduction of resources in the EOC. Overall, the demobilization will take us well into the summer months as we ramp up our recovery. It's not a very fast operation. We have to assess what the departments can resume and what from the EOC operations that it can accept uh, within the existing resources and then identify the gap. While we continue to respond to the emergency, we reassign assets to prepare for the recovery. This is known as demobilizing. The effort is surgical. We try to be precise. We continue to assess the risk and if the conditions warrant, we will have to build back up if it's needed. Kip, Lee, Jay, and myself have spent time with each one of the section coordinators and the branch directors to evaluate what can be either accepted back into the department or continue as part of the recovery operation. And as part of that evaluation to mobilize, staff have identified the resources and operations that will continue to operate in the support of, our, of the need of the public. Demobilization does not mean we are stopping today with all this great work. It does not mean we're closing the EOC today. In fact, we move into recovery. Some of the programs, as we've mentioned, will continue to operate outside the normal department operations. For example, the food operations. This will continue as we stand up the recovery team. The practice of demobilization and forming the recovery team is hard and complex. We don't want critical fu functions falling through the cracks. We need to keep the momentum going into the recovery and into resilience. We still need to meet the needs of the public and focus on the economic growth and establishing the new normal. We will also continue to adjust operations to determine the best way to use any of the federal assistance that is made available, as Lee just described. This transition will require more engagement with our partners and to understand who will continue on with us to ensure that we've addressed the needs of those most affected. At the same time, Kip, Lee, Jay, and I have been paying attention to the other conditions that we are facing and certainly will have some action coming up. With the current Derek Caban trial, there is real potential for civil unrest. With this dry weather, wildfire, and PSP events are looming. And of course, as we have all these earthquake fault zones here in San Jose, go ahead and pick your own favorite fault. We have to be ready for that as well. So we're in the mitigation preparedness phases for those pending emergencies. Back to you, Lee. Thank you, Ray. We've talked a little bit during 3.1 uh, about res responding or our responses about doing and recovery is doing with. Um, and much throughout the year in our emergency operations center, we uh, run an incident uh, command system and, and that's how we communicate. However, recovery is much different. And for recovery, um, for our community and organization to be successful in recovery, this joint recovery must be embedded into core work that the city does every day. As Ray's mentioned, um, over the next several months, some of the EOC items and programs will start to go back to city departments while others will be moved into the recovery process. This integration into the core work of the city every day um, is our roadmap, the roadmap that the council and the administration put together together. It will allow us to be focused and, ally and aligned for the most uh, pressing needs of our community and organization. Our roadmap is our priority projects, strategies, and policies at a high level. As we start to begin more detailed discussions about each of these items in the roadmap, as well as the recovery phase overall, the administration will be returning to council. We are fortunate that the funding from both federal and state governments has been substantial. However, the community's need still outstrips our available resources. The fact, uh, this fact makes the prioritization of these resources all the more important 
with equity at its forefront. We must continue to ask the question of who benefits and who is burdened. Um, those questions apply both to the impacts of the pandemic as well as to the allocation of relief and recovery funding. The mayor's March budget message as amended and approved by the council on March 16th continues to place an emphasis on serving those most negatively impacted by the pandemic. This emphasis will need to be expanded during the build out of the city's strategy to transition into community and economic recovery. And our approach and challenge will be to equitably allocate resources for community and economic recovery in a way that also acknowledges that the funding is temporary. Many of the services that will be provided uh, would need to be discontinued as the one-time funding is expended. To help us integrate recovery work into the city's um, work with the council, we'll be hosting two meetings um, at a minimum in the coming weeks. One will continue the conversation around community and economic recovery um, strategies and approaches that we've discussed with the council already. Um, starting to talk about tactics and getting feedback. And the other is the mapping exercise and the resourcing of this work that will come forward through the budget process at a budget study session where we map out the available funding through the American Rescue Plan and recommendations by staff, as well as other alternative funding sources that we can bring into the budget process. So those will be coming in early May to align with the budget process. That concludes staff's presentation. Uh, Dave and Kip and Ray and I are here for any questions the council may have. Thank you, Mayor. Great, thank you for that excellent report, uh, Lee and everybody on the team. Okay, uh, let's go to the community first and then we'll come back to council for more questions. Paul Soto. Uh, yeah, Paul Soto. Um, Lee and, and Kip, I've been going to these meetings every single week for the duration. I have never heard a report with respect to COVID that had the nuance, the accuracy of nuance and comprehension and understanding of what it is that we're really actually looking at. You see, we need to be able to make a distinction and separate this COVID money that's coming in See, that COVID money, COVID highlighted the racism that was already going on. See, but nobody acknowledged it. Nobody acknowledged it. Now, the Mexicans are just lazy. They just, they, they just like living like that. Okay, what this did is it highlighted that now. Oh, okay, now we got to be equitable. We got we to gotta deal with that. No, 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 Charlie, that money came from the federal government. It didn't come from Santa Clara County. It didn't come from San Jose. Okay, so now that the apparatus is in place, to deal with the historical injustices, these have to be normalized. And I'm hoping that there can be some advocacy on the council to force that, not ask for it, no. The Chicanos in this city, the descendants of Sasi Puedes, the, the families that are gonna suffer generations for the losses that they occur, that occurred here with, res with respect to COVID, they, all of us together, it demands and it compels the conscience of our leaders. And not even our leaders, you're not leaders, you're servants. You are servants and you serve the needs of the community. And so what I'm asking you is to advocate for the allocation within these budgets to have those normalized because the federal government money came to address that. But what we discovered was that it would actually has a historical precedence. So now we have to allocate it because you guys have already been on record acknowledging that that needs to be rectified. Thank you. Thank you, Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thank you for the words of Paul Soto. Um, it's, it's a lot to understand uh, the depth of what COVID has created for this feature of this planet, basically. And uh, I hope we do our best to, to comprehend it and, and come out with really sustainable solutions from it, and like what Paul is, is asking about. And it's from those sustainability ideas. Uh, I hope we learn that we don't have to do this to ourselves again. We don't have to social plan with, with, these, uh, with these hurtful ways to create our better future in the, in the future. <laughs> I hope that's the first lessons uh, we learn, the first steps we take 
in asking these important questions of uh, what Paul is asking. And uh, they're important and they're meaningful. New questions are coming up of uh, health care forgiveness uh, for private hospital systems. Can there be health care forgiveness packages for people with that? Um, you know, there's far reaching things happening and uh, how to talk about those sorts of things can be of interest instead of just how do we get the California economy back in motion? It's, it's, it is more than that at this point. And uh, how, do, how, do, how can I respond as a community? How can you offer direction to me as elders, basically? You know, that's what I'm asking yourselves. And I think Paul is too. What can be that good direction? And, uh, and just simply handing down the next directive. And uh, good luck in those efforts and how to do that. Uh, Fremont is having some difficulties uh, with their school reopenings because they, they put too much emphasis on their technology practices when it could have been just simply person-to-person -person community. I hope you guys make the same efforts and uh, make it a person-to-person -person experience and not a technology experience. Thank you. Thank you. All right, coming back to the council. Council Member Foley. Thank you, uh, and Lee and Ray, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions, actually. Lee, you talked about the homebound uh, vaccinations in certain zip codes, but what about those who are homes, homebound outside of those zip codes? I'm particularly concerned about our senior mobile home parks who have a lot of homebound seniors not in the zip codes that you mentioned. Yeah, so that. Uh, thank you for the question. That program started yesterday, um, and so they're focusing on those five zip codes this week um, and starting to pivot to other zip codes in the county, um, specifically with our own personnel within the city over the next several uh, days and weeks. Okay, and, and we actually have those emergency bags that you created, and we will be delivering them to our mobile home park uh, occupants and giving information on rental assistance as well and the vaccine information that was included in that. So I appreciate you. Thank you for those bags and it, it'll be a good uh, opportunity for go, us to go out and talk to those seniors if they, if, they, if they open their doors. If they don't, we'll just leave it there. That's fine, socially distanced, of course. The other question I had, and, and you alluded to it, but you didn't talk about it in specifics, uh, Ray, and I'm assuming that's because you're not ready to talk about it. We're um, at our council offices, we're talking about how, when, when are we going back to City Hall and what will that look, look like? I know you probably don't have that in great detail, but when should I ask that question again? <laughs> Oh, and he turned his video off. <laughs> um, actually, okay. you know, while we figured that out, Kip is actually leading, uh, leading some of that work. So I think we should defer to, to Kip on that question. Uh, okay. Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. Thank you for the question, Council Member Foley. That's a it was question that's on everybody's on mind these days as we are getting ready to, to be back uh, at it. Uh, I would say the... Um, the, the biggest marker I would say is until we get to the next stage, the yellow stage, we're not going to be doing any significant changes to the way that we are uh, doing our service delivery in terms of being in City Hall. And it's only as we get to that next stage, which for us is stage nine, that we will begin to uh, look at a more broader reopening of City Hall and other service facilities. The good news is I think we'll be in stage nine for a fairly short amount of time, and then we'll be actually through to the next stage on that. We are already beginning the planning and preparation now for what that return to work would look like. I think the most complicated part of it, just to have a little asterisk on it, is that we, for the foreseeable future, will want to make sure that we have the opportunity to be hybrid. Some people will still be working at home. And in terms of community engagement, I think some people have actually appreciate the fact that they don't have to sit in council all day waiting 
for uh, their opportunity to comment, but can do that from home. So we, we need to make some investments in that hybrid uh, ability. But the bottom line answer is we'll begin to look at bringing people back into City Hall as we enter into the next stage. We'll do that in a phased approach to make sure that we can do that safely. And for a while, it will continue to have the social distancing and the mask wearing until we're cleared from uh, higher authorities to, to go back to a more new normal once we're more fully vaccinated and at or close to herd immunity. Yeah, uh, I uh, thank you. <laughs> I knew you weren't going to give me a specific date. D does it look <laughs> <laughs> and And I really don't expect one, but uh, we're... It, it, let me know if I'm off track that August may be a good month to start thinking about it. Well, I, I, you know, I actually am even slightly more optimistic than that. Um, I've always, from, from the earliest analysis that we've done, have felt that January, February, and March would be very uh, relatively low amounts of the vaccine available, that April, May, and June, we would see the vaccine at scale. Um, given the effectiveness of the county in both scaling up their vaccine operation and in making sure that their sites are accessible across the need areas, I'm actually quite confident that they're going to hit or their 75% uh, in August mark and actually hopeful that they may hit it sooner. My personal uh, prediction uh, not to be held to is that I think July 4th will be a bit of an independence day for us and that by that point, we will be through much of what we need to in order to resume near normal operations within uh, functions like City Hall. Though, of course, on that day will be a holiday, so it will be after July 4th. Very good. Thank you very much. Those are the only questions I had. Thank you for all of your work. It's, it, it feels good to be heading into the recovery and the resilience phase. It, it, it really does. With vaccines out there, there is so much hope around folks when you talk to them and they've been vaccinated. They actually have smiles on their face. They seem much more at peace and much more willing to go out and, and do things. And I've even ventured out into a few restaurants in person inside myself and was really surprised at how they're thriving inside. And that's uh, great. That's really wonderful. So thank you. I appreciate all that you're doing and that you've done over the last so many year and year plus. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Esparza. Thank you. Um, thanks for this presentation. Um, really appreciate it. Um, and really particularly appreciate a couple of things that our community's recovery um, is obviously dependent on vaccination successes. Um, First off, thanks for um, vaccinating, you know, really prioritizing our workforce. I know Kaiser and other entities have also been um, vaccinating some of our folks. Do we plan to continue those efforts at the fairgrounds? So the at the fairgrounds, anyway, it is closed to first doses until the county receives additional uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccines, but it is still open for second doses. The county is actually hopeful that they receive a, I wouldn't say large shipment, but uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, elevated, what they've called elevated shipment sometime uh, end of this week, early next week. And so that site could be reopened for additional first shots um, next week if that happens. Okay. Um, yeah, obviously capacity is huge. I was both happy, but also disappointed to hear the governor's announcement because I know how badly we need vaccines. Um, the Eastridge site is a max of, I think, about 1,400 folks a day. Vietnamese American Cultural Center is a max of about 400 folks a day. My office is hearing from about 50 people every day who can't get vaccinated. And these are folks that do live in some of the hardest hit zip codes um, in the county. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of frustration out there in terms of um, when they can expect to get these appointments. <clears throat> and so we've just, we've been telling folks to, to wait uh, um, and getting as many folks that we can, um, you know, if possible, if we can get them an appointment, 
what what do we tell our folks? I mean, because I think we're in the point where we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, which is, all right, we didn't have vaccines a couple of weeks ago, but we were expecting them. So we were telling folks, hey, you know, plan to get vaccinated. We're standing up sites. Um, what do we tell those folks today who are not able to get those appointments, even though they're eligible? Yeah, so that's a great question, and, and quite frankly, it's it's something that we're scared about as well. Um, you know, Kip and I have talked about it quite a bit, um, and, and Carolina and her team are thinking through it. Um, you know, within our own county, obviously, supply to the vaccine and, and the appointments is is scarce, but we keep on opening up more, more tiers, so the congestion can only get a little bit bigger. Um, so we are starting to experiment with some messages around patients and trying to provide the context of hey, expect some delays in the next few weeks, but please keep at it. Um, I wouldn't say any of that uh, communication material is refined or tested, but it's something that we're going to be experimenting with, um, and we've started to over the next several days. So we can make that available uh, to the council as we always do as we start to implement that. But it is something that we're playing, paying close attention to, and, and Kip and I have continued to even you know, look at some of the broader um, communication strategies, as well as some of the, the targeting and engagement and mobilization. Um, and we have decided to keep the foot to the pedal, um, given the emergency. Um, but we are worried uh, about some of our residents just getting sick of the, the continued uh, messaging without the availability to get an appointment. So it's something that we're watching closely. Okay, thank you. Um, and some of these sites have sort of hard, you know, limits whereas other sites could do much more. Um, they're just only limited by vaccines. Um, and so I would just, I encourage the county um, and our partners to continue to look at some of those sites so that hopefully the floodgates will open at some point and then we can um, do some larger distributions. Um, I had another comment on the economic recovery. I wanted to thank the EOC team um, for uh, helping us a few weeks ago. I personally went door to door um, to different um, areas. Uh, I think I spoke previously about going to Little Saigon, going to the Grand Century Mall and going to um, Vietnam Town door to door to our small businesses there. And um, the good news is that uh, particularly in Grand Century Mall um, and Vietnam Town is the businesses were really well aware of the uh, different opportunities to get help. Um, and in fact, some folks had already received their checks, which was really, really cool to see, um, <clears throat> but not so in other places. And so I wanted to just to highlight two things. One is language accessibility that we really need in particular, Vietnamese and Spanish speaking folks doing that outreach. Um, and the other thing is um, a lot of folks don't email. Um, it, it's very much in person or over the phone, and um, we really need to tailor our efforts um, to particularly those hard hit businesses um, in our hardest hit areas, um, because those are the folks that do get kind of left behind on the mass emails and sort of the more traditional approaches that I know, for example, the state has taken. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and then um, I had a question about our recovery um, efforts, our, our both response and recovery efforts. So how are we going to change how we do contracts with NGOs? Like we've been doing them in three months batch, three months batches. Um, are we going to change that approach? And two, are we also going to add some capacity for the small businesses or small nonprofits, excuse me, the small nonprofits that we've been leaning on so heavily. I'm assuming we're going to lean on those nonprofits for recovery efforts as well. How are we going to structure our um, contracts and capacity support for these efforts? That's a really good question. And I would say I think that is actually evolving and we are expecting some additional guidance around the American Relief Plan from different departments, um, specifically with Treasury when the guidance comes out, as, as well as a few others on how we should be procuring services um, 
as you know, council member, early on in a response or of, of any kind of disaster, we have a certain amount of flexibility, um, but some of that um, wouldn't say is dried up, but now that we're shifting from response to recovery, procurement ends up being a little bit different. So hopefully when the guidance comes out, we'll have additional clarity. I do think, you know, as, as we've said, um, and, and Ray and, and Kip and I are kind of planning this, I think part of it depends on, on what it is for as we start to take some of the stuff that we've operationalized in the um, EOC and put it back into the department. That department might have a way of decurring some of those um, services or, or arrangements that uh, they deem necessary versus some of the things will stay in kind of a recovery op operation center and we may want to handle it a different way. So I think it's largely, um, you know, gonna hinge on what that guidance is, um, which we do expect, I, I know, um, at least on the, the flexible funding that the 223 million, we, we expect guidance on in early May, that'll dictate how we can procure some of these services. Thank you. And hopefully we can include them in those conversations mm -hmm. as well. I know, um, you know, it's been quite the process during this pandemic. Um, and lastly, I just really had a comment, which was, um, to build off of what you said, that as we have equity and response and equity and recovery, that we balance that with the city's, our other equity efforts. I'm not even gonna ask what that is because I know we don't have an answer to that, um, but that we balance that so that we don't return to normal because remember normal wasn't that great. And so we really need to have a more comprehensive strategy as to how we rebuild our city. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Mayhem. Thanks Mayor and thanks for the report Lee. Um, just a quick question here. I, I, I will say I was interested to learn that the targeted canvassing efforts seem to be fruitful and that's um, makes sense and is, is just awesome to hear. So hopefully as supply increases, we can we can do more of that. Would love for our office to help as well. Um, you know, I, I guess I may be thinking, I may be anticipating the May sessions we're gonna do, but I, you know, I've been thinking a lot and hearing from residents a lot about protecting small businesses and then of course, um, renter relief and ensuring that we're you know, implementing the rent relief program in a way that's reducing debts and ensuring that folks don't become uh, homeless later. So I, I guess the question, and again, I assume we're getting into this more in our sessions in May, but on, on both small businesses and tenants, what kind of data do we have? And are we, to what extent, I, I won't use the word dashboard, but to what extent can we track the impact we're having the remaining need? And, and is it, I guess the second part of that question, so part of it's kind of data visibility. And then the second part would just be, you know, as we have these updates on our recovery, how can we best ensure that the council and the public's aware of kind of where we, what the need is and how close we are to actually fulfilling. I know we're not gonna have all the resources we need, but it would be helpful to know how many businesses are we losing? How many are at risk? How many of the state uh, funds have we been able to help businesses connect with to keep them afloat, um, you know, and then obviously with tenants, I think kind of clear on what some of those metrics might be. And, and I know that's not all within our control, but I, I just, around those two priority areas would love to better understand what we what we can know and, and what we can get in the form of uh, quantifiable updates in, in 3.1 going forward. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think with rental, rental relief, dashboards are actually part of the format and, and we need to follow that process. Um, and I'd ask Kip to jump in if, if he wants to elaborate, but I, I certainly think that around recovery and small business assistance and how they're doing and, and where we're headed, that we would follow some type of similar format to have you know, data to derive our insights um, or provide insights um, to, to then allow us to make decisions and present those to you as part of that process. So Kip, I, I know that you and the recovery team and, and OED have, have thought through this. I know that we don't have data today, um, but I don't know if you have anything to add on any of the planning. I would just say maybe three things really quickly. One, it's important um, that we really have a sense of, of what we're getting for the tax dollars invested, whether they're federal, state, or local. 
Uh, two, it's really hard to do well, uh, to be honest about it, in terms of, of, of getting that comprehensive understanding of what the actual impact is. Sometimes it's more of an output measure that we'll get and we'll assume impact. Um, and then three, we really believe this is one of the things we need to invest in comprehensively. So it's not each program trying to figure this out for themselves, but that we'll take a, a bit more centralized approach in terms of developing that capability so that we can say, for example, uh, from the place-based viewpoint, where are we investing our funds and what are we getting out? Or from maybe a business standpoint, where are, where are the businesses that are in, affected and what types are they and what are they accessing? And so all of that means, uh, in my mind, a more um, robust central capacity so that each individual program doesn't have to figure it out for themselves. So that's one of the recommendations that we'll come back with as part of the budget is to, is to build out that capability, building on our excellent work with our geographic information system team that Matt Lesh leads and others. Council member staff just texted me too that we do have some small business data available through our community and economic recovery task force. So we will make that available to the council. Great, thanks, Lee and Kip. And, and I, I get it's it's a big investment, and in many ways we're probably building infrastructure that's going to help us a year or two or the next crisis or just ongoing work. I, I get it. it takes a lot of time to stand that up and, and refine it and and ensure we're getting good data and we can analyze it. I, I guess I would just, from my perspective, love to see whatever data we do have um, right now protecting small businesses and, and um, reducing debt and displacement for renters feel like kind of top of mind priorities. I'm sure there are some others, but just getting that data into this, this update and kind of making the council aware of it on a, at least a monthly basis, if not more frequently, I think would be, would be helpful to just maintain focus there and make sure we're aware, but um, appreciate how hard it is to get good data and have that infrastructure in place. So glad to hear we're, working on it and planning to get it into the budget cycle. And, and that'll hopefully be a capability we have down the road. Uh, that was really my only question. Thanks again for the, the update. Thank you, uh, Council Member Cohen. Yeah, just a quick question on the, you said that you finished the um, uh, police department and, and fire department uh, vaccinations. Do we have any, um, Data as we talked about this, I think last time that we talked about that, what percentages have been vaccinated in those departments? So, Kip, I know that um, I, I forget honestly how we answered this last time. I think some of that is is confidential because of, yeah, of yeah. privacy concerns, um, but I don't know how and when we can report on that. Kip, do you know? I, the chief is actually on for fire, so I know um, they've kept. Tighter, the tightest track of all of us on that. Okay. Though again, it's optional in terms of some of the information. So I'd ask the chief, perhaps, such Chief Sapien, to weigh in on the fire side. And I'm not sure if there's anybody here uh, representing uh, police who could more accurately answer that on the police side. Chief Sapien, if you're available, that would be fantastic for you to have you step in. He may be away from keyboard. Uh, he's often dealing with yeah, I think so. I don't see actual fires. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's give him a moment to Please. to reconnect. I'll shoot him a text, and yeah. then uh, we'll have him answer that. Uh, Council Member Cohen. Yeah, and just just sort of next question on the firefighters. I know there's a lot of them. A lot of their calls, or they do a number of calls to homebound uh, residents who need regular service. Are are, are we maybe thinking about of having the fire department ask people? they need vaccination and maybe get them on a list as they do some of those calls to homes to try to reach yeah. we, we are doing that the, as we do the phone banking and the other outreach that's one of the things that we try to check for is people who might need uh, be homebound or, or or for other reasons not be willing or able to travel and so we've been providing that information to the county as well as information on six bid facilities mobile home parks and other data sources where we would expect people to be uh, less able to travel and and where there be clusters of, of elderly who might need that kind of support so we've been coordinating with the county on that and we hope that that will inform their prioritization of, of where to go and, and have gotten a good response from them so far. Yeah, I was thinking just that feedback, maybe even from the fire department as they make those calls to maybe asking questions and trying to find out who's, who, does, who would like to get on a list uh, so we can add them specifically. We'll do, I'll follow up on that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Davis. Thank you. I really want to thank you guys for the very um, 
information-packed presentation. A lot of good news here, and I'm smiling about it, and I know Councilmember Foley was also smiling about it. Uh, I also, I wanted to say the fact that we're looking at um, going through all of the funding sources and aligning them so that we can preserve the um, the American Rescue Plan dollars for our general fund. I just, I really want to thank you guys for making sure that we are using our dollars as wisely as possible and, and allocating them as precisely as we can. I think that will um, stand our taxpayers in good stead in the years to come as we try to get, <laughs> try to recover. Um, I did have one question. Lee, you, you went through the, um, the number of doses per week at the state level. And I'm just trying to, I was trying to do the math at the same time as I was hearing your numbers. And so I got a little mixed up on the, the doses that the state is getting per week. And then what was expected for the first half of April and the second half of April. Yeah. Can you give me those those three numbers again? Sure, yeah, and, so, and sorry, I kind of threw that out fast. Um, right now, the state is receiving roughly 1.8 million doses per week. Okay. Um, they've been told by federal agencies and the federal government that in um, the first half of April that that should increase to 2.5 million doses. So hopefully next week and the following week. And that by the end of April, that they'd be over three million doses, um, you know. And so that is that is below the capacity that the state system has built out. Where we, the, according to the state, they have capacity for three million doses right now, and we'll be scaling up. Um, but it's a similar trend at a local level for us. Our own county and healthcare uh, system has greater capacity than the seventy-two thousand doses we received this week. So the county got 72,000 this week? Yes. And we have the capacity for 200,000, I think you said. Correct. Okay. And do we know how many Californians have gotten one or two doses? You know, there, I believe- I'm just trying to do the math of like how many weeks of 3 million or how many weeks do we have left before everybody's got a chance? to get one or two doses. Yeah, so I don't have that in front of me um, and I need to put up my email. I believe that it is in the press release from the governor's office that they, okay. they, they put out like an hour ago. So I can forward that I to can... the council. Thanks. But I believe that statistic is in there. So it sounds roughly like KIPP's July 4th Independence Day is, is gonna be good if we get the 3 million a week by the end of April. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think we need to see the capacity grow in the month, month of April. And again, Kip is absolutely correct in that, um, that January and February and March, there was always going to be a strain on the supply chain and everything else. Um, so, um, you know, hopefully um, the increase from last week to this week is a small sign that, that the capacity is growing. Um, but I would say that this month would be really pivotal to see if we're going to be able to meet those targets or not. And California has administered 20 million, according to the press release from noon um, so far. Um, and the, the state's a bit more aggressive than I. They are uh, looking for June 15th as a full reopening. Um, I tend to tend to stick with my July 4th. <laughs> well, you've been right so far, Kip, so I'm going with your numbers. Thank you. Good idea not to bet against Kip. Uh, Councilmember Rennes. Councilman Arenas, you may be trying to talk right now, but your advice. Oh, I'm I'm so sorry. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, thank you uh, for your patience. Um, I'm just going to start off by saying thank you for the presentation. Um, it was a lot to follow, and I hope that we can get some of that breakdown of the data. I, I know that you stayed on one. Um, on one of those slides, and and Kip was really astute in telling you uh, you've been you you went too far ahead. I couldn't tell you that you had gone too far ahead because there was no like indicator on those slides. And I just hope that we can get a little bit more of that information, maybe on a, uh, I don't know, a fact sheet, a, a, a report or something. Um, so, so anyways, it, it's, it's a lot uh, to, to, to process, um, especially for our community at home, but certainly for ourselves as well. Um, so one of the, one of the, 
uh, items that I was just thinking about as my colleagues had been speaking, um, and we are um, kind of adopting this com this this um, language about recovery and moving forward. And although I heard from the presentation it's not necessarily we're just you know moving forward and this is done and over with but that, that this is a process right mm -hmm. um uh, nonetheless it, it's it's uh for me I, I feel a lot of hesitation and anxiety I'll, I'll be honest with you because I looked at um I, I looked at the maps for our county uh for information throughout March, mid-March is I think what was, what, whatever was recent. And I think it was the last four weeks is what is um, the information that's that's being shared. And Latinos continue to be the lowest in terms of vaccination, the highest in terms of infection rate. Um, and I saw that there's, there is only 86,000 Latinos that have been vaccinated out of 643,000 vaccinated in the county. So that's only about 13% of vaccinations. And there's 415,000 Latino residents in the county. So in, in the whole county, that would be about 20%. And, you know, and this is in comparison to the other um, a larger subgroups or uh, the other uh, groups uh, like um, uh, white residents or Asian um, residents, which are white is 37 and Asian are 45%. And so for me, this is continues to be a, a huge concern. Um, I know that play space is, is very effective. I'm seeing it on the maps. Um, and when I looked at the map, uh, to see um, in terms of the vaccination um, rate, everywhere around Eastridge seemed to have a really, a, just a great vaccination rate, yep. um, which means one, our outreach is working, two, the play space strategy is also working. Um, I only had one little concern and that was around the Welch. So I think as, as, as you start getting further away from the place that the vaccination is at, is the less uh, vaccinations that you, or at least that I'm seeing. And then as, you know, as I zoomed out um, to see uh, the rate of vaccinations in, in not only in just in my area, but uh, in the east side as well, as I zoomed out and above, a little bit above Kelly Park, Kelly Park has about um, more than 49%, which is great. But above that, there's a lot of yellow um, which means that it's less than 36%. The, this continues to be true in the zip code for 95122, uh, 95116. And then in the areas of, of Alum Rock, uh, Mayfair, oh. of Mount Pleasant, um, there, and uh, a, a really significant area in the downtown. And so I think if we, we want to continue to be um, uh, surgical in terms of our efforts and um, on our investments, I think we need to continue to look at how are these vaccination rates um, doing and, and so that we can continually pivot as, as soon as we have updated information that we continue to um, pivot and pivot um, and I know that sometimes it takes time to just gain some ground in an area or just to, you know, feel like there's some results in this area and then to pivot might seem very frustrating. Um, but I think uh, we're starting to see some success in some of the play space strategies, like I said. And so I think um, what we need to do is continue to pursue um, some of these vaccination rates. Because when we talk about recovery, and I think uh, Councilmember Esparza said it, you know, recovery is is also uh, is connected to the well-being of of our residents. And if our residents are he aren't healthy and they can't return to to work, then the recovery is only meant for some of us. And this is is the the misstep that I don't want us to take as a city, in terms of. Um, inadvertently leaving people behind because as we move forward in a recovery phase in a in a in a um, more um, 
uh, more freedom in terms of of uh, restrictions, I think the further behind we leave um, the most vulnerable. And um, right now I'm seeing that as, as Latinos being some of those vulnerable, vulnerable communities, I'm sure that there's a lot of other subgroups that, that I'm not um, putting a magnifying glass under and we should take a look at what those are. Uh, certainly seniors are probably the other group um, that we're, and I heard uh, Council Member Foley talk about that as well. Um, and so I appreciate that. I, I just want us to make sure that what what uh, Paul Soto and the resident who called in and, and said, you know, uh, the pandemic just um, allowed us to to view these inequities that had existed in our communities for a very long time because of systems and um, and and just um, laws that sometimes created some of these inequities. Um, that we're taking a look at what um, isn't working for some of our communities and how can we um, support them. And so I don't know that we can move for, I don't know that we can move anywhere until we have a certain baseline for some of these groups. And I want to know what that baseline is. Are we comfortable in saying that we can move forward or that we can relax on outreach if we are less than 36% vaccinated in an area. What is what does that benchmark of success look like for us? So I, you know, let me let me start with, you know, Kip and I wanted to, in the, the spirit of partnership, give you guys a glimpse into some of the more internal things in the emergency operations center that we need to work through. Um, let me start with saying, um, the outreach, the play space, and getting people vaccinated, that is something that is going to continue for a very long time. That will not be demobilized. You know, I, I, I think two things. One is, you know, through this pandemic, it's been a very different response. And there's been a host of new services that the city has created and we've operationalized in the emergency operations center. And some of that does need to go back to departments and to ensure that there is a handoff and that something doesn't get lost in that transi transition. There's been new policies that govern some of this work, new procedures, and, and quite frankly, people from various departments. So giving our own emergency operation time to work through that, you know, a three, four month process, um, because there's cracks there and some of those programs are really important. You know, specifically to the vaccination task force, you know, recovery in my mind, and, and as, as we were trained by Ray and others, recovery really starts when the, the, the life threat is gone. And so I, you know, the vaccination task force is going to be something that continues beyond the emergency operations center through recovery. Um, and I think as, you know, capacity of the vaccine continues to grow, that that's something that we will put the foot down on the gas even more so than we're doing now, because we have seen positive results. And I think, you know, um, Ann Tran and Ryan Dooling are leaders of our vaccination task force. They're on that county website and the dashboard quite a bit. And so like, you know, you referenced Mayfair. That's been one that's been glaring at us for, for like two or three weeks now. So we can see the progress that, you know, our work has at, at, at Eastridge and some of the other sites. And then you can see the numbers at Mayfair. So how do we get in there? And, and the county has been a great partner in that conversation for the last few weeks, trying to figure out how we do that. So that will be work that continues on, even while we start to demobilize things in the EOC, um, because we do want to ensure that everyone can partake in community recovery together, not just a few or... Um, you know, a portion of our population. And if I could be very specific on, on a kind of answering your metrics question, if the, if the countywide goal is for us to have 75% of mm -hmm. our population vaccinated, then the equity goal is to make sure that that 75% applies to all of the neighborhoods, it yep. applies to all of the seniors, it applies to all the most vulnerable. So what, I'm ex what we're expecting is you'll see, a, you'll see a kind of a curve that looks like this in terms of number of vaccinations and it'll start to go down and then you'll have this long tail. Our, our interest as a city is, is twofold. One, ensuring that all of our employees, especially our frontline employees, are, have the vaccines access that they need so they can be providing service. And then making sure that those who have been most impacted and most vulnerable continue to have that, that access to the vaccine. So as Lee said, I expect we'll be in it doing advocacy, doing targeted work, learning as we go, pivoting, 
becoming more micro focused focused on individual neighborhoods or aspects as we learn more data um, until that long tail that everybody who needs it has a chance to get up to that 75% mark where we're all at herd immunity. And because again, you really can't begin recovery until your, your neighborhood is safe, whether that's Welch Park or Rose Garden or Hoffman Via Monte or uh, where, pick your favorite neighborhood. So um, that's, that's how what I see as the goal for our vaccine task force, shots in arms for our most vulnerable until they get to that 75% mark. Okay, so Welch is, is happens to not be one of those uh, areas that has it has had a slight improvement, but still it, it needs a little bit more love. Um, uh, like I mentioned, um, so so how do we connect this um, to to what you were saying earlier, Kip, um, and or, or maybe it was it was Lee, um, but there there is an effort to. Um, to uh, support the county with some additional um, resources. And I heard you saying that, that, you know, that you were going through contracting. And I had asked this question previously, um, what are we getting out of this, right? How are we benefiting from this? And I know overall the city is benefiting because we're supporting the county and, and uh, uh, you know, adding to their capacity. Um, but I like to see that, um, that the county in exchange for some of the support also drilled down a little further than what they've already done um, because some of what they're doing uh, uh, or what we're all doing together is working in some areas and in some other areas, it's not really making a difference um, in terms of vaccinations. Um, and so how can we, um, ensure that we get what we need um, in terms of resources when we're helping out and our areas in San Jose in the downtown area in, you know, um, around Fisher Middle School, I took a look at the census tract and it had a 26% vaccination rate. I mean, that's just absolutely low. Um, and so, so how do we how do we leverage the resources that we're providing to the county um, so that they in turn come back to us and and to our city? Yeah, so I, I can start, and then Kip, if you'd like to jump in, I'd say two things. You know, the county has made um, obviously where to put vaccination sites. There's there's been several factors, but one of it is you know capacity and does the site work well for staffing? And so, um, given that their organization is stretched. Um, you know, we believe and what we've seen thus far through the conversations of, of stepping in to help staff some of those sites, if we can staff more sites, more can open in San Jose because we're only actually staffing and stepping in from a logistical standpoint on San Jose sites. So it just becomes easier for the county to go ahead and step into that space. And then I'd say, you know, since we've engaged in this conversation and we've been doing the hiring, um, at least for the past several weeks, um, you know, the ideas of more mobile clinics. Um, the ideas of look at the dashboard, something needs to go here. The county has been quite a, a good partner um, in trying to push um, uh, for additional access to vaccines for, for those areas and trying to make that happen. So I think, you know, us adding the logistical and the capacity support makes it easier for them to go ahead and ramp up some of those sites. Um, but we can be much more purposeful and, and push on that as well, um, kind of about timelines and, and outcomes as additional capacity to the vaccine becomes greater. Wonderful. Um, thank you for, for saying that and for um, and uh, for exploring that as as well. I know that, that the county has been a good partner. Um, we've obviously are seeing some really good results in our vaccination rates. Um, I, I just continue to be concerned about us move, moving forward and just leaving people behind is what I see visually is what I see. And, um, and until those people behind us uh, can catch up or at least you know, um, be at a, at a point where, where they can come back and try to recover in this economy. I, you know, we, we can't really say that we are, um, I think we, when we, when we commit to equity, we have to make sure that we explore all strategies that lead us back to the road of equity. Um, and so I, I appreciate that. Um, 
And uh, the, the other piece I, I was wondering was about um, Kaiser. And I, um, I know that, that there isn't a wrong door in terms of the county, we're gonna take folks in anywhere, but I know that a lot of Kaiser patients are encouraged to go to Kaiser sites. Mm -hmm. um, and is the, is, do you know of the specific outreach um, from Kaiser uh, for Latino communities? Is there one, I guess? It, well, what I do know is about the site that they're partnering with us specifically in the Vietnamese American Cultural Center, and we will be doing extensive outreach in both Spanish and Vietnamese and working with the immediate neighborhood and for the Latino community for that site in particular, which is intended to be a beyond member site. There certainly is a no wrong door, uh, generally speaking, but the part that we have the most influence over, I would say, is that site, and we're, we're going to work to make sure that that is aggressively marketed and engaged with uh, the communities that are most vulnerable around that site and in the east side. Uh, as in terms of the overall Kaiser strategy, I'm really not well versed to speak to that at the moment and what they have or haven't done beyond their member outreach, which I know they've been focusing on a lot. Wonderful. So I wonder if um, so part of the, the next steps, and it's great that they're working um, with the Vietnamese Cultural Center um, and offering um, uh, their, you know, two different languages uh, outre outreach and hoping to, to get those folks in. Um, but then I also hope that we can take a look at um, the other areas that I mentioned and uh, in some of the downtown areas, like I said, um, where a lot of our unhoused um, um, unfortunately reside on our sidewalks and near um, homes. Um, much more closer than maybe in other areas. And so um, if, if we can get Kaiser to continue to uh, partner with us, um, maybe target some of those other areas um, as a very small place-based approaches are, are just wonderful. Um, I, you know, I think for me that that is it. I was, you know, um, I was just really concerned about the um, demobilizing and what that meant for for our community and i understand that it's a process it's not you know we're just not going to close doors and and that's it and we're over and done with um, uh, but i i hope that we can continue to um uh behave like we are not in recovery but that we are um uh, you know we're in like the first or earlier stages and and that we are um prompted by that uh in order to conduct outreach, uh, to increase vaccination rates. Um, and I guess, I'm sorry to say, just let's not relax. <laughs> I know everybody, we all wanna relax and we wanna move forward, um, but I caution us to do that um, because like I said, Latinos are not in any better place um, than when we first started talking about vaccines. Um, Okay, and and then the other uh, the other uh, area that I wanted to talk about is, is some of the streamlining that's allowed for um, for some of our programs um, in terms of contracting with folks and how that's going to impact us. Is there a, a, a kind of an opportunity cost for for us moving forward in, in terms of we're not going to be able to streamline and maybe contract with certain providers? When when is that? When is that threshold? So, you know, I don't think we're near the threshold yet. We've, we've structured things in a way and gone through FEMA procurement. So as the price of those things rises, we're, we're still in good standing with those providers, even if we needed to go back out. Um, you know, with the new dollars coming in, the stuff separate from FEMA recovery, um, we've been told a lot is going to be in the guidance about procurement and working with CBOs. So given the Biden administration has talked about this needs to be as flexible as possible and done with the community, I'm hoping and thinking that that is going to be flexible for us um, and that we won't have kind of the, the same federal kind of procurement hurdles that we've had in the past, um, but we won't know until early May when that guidance is given. Got it. Okay, so then I guess will we early May? Um, will that line up with um, how will that line up with our budget process? 
So what we were doing is the mapping exercise um, that we're going through, um, as well as the guidance in early May, allows us to come into the budget process. So um, Jim Shannon, city's budget director, and, and Kip and I have talked about kind of all the money coming in on this, including that in one of the budget study sessions with recommendations um, based off of the mayor's budget message um, that you amended and passed, as well as our own proposals um, that we've worked with through the recovery process and response process. So that will be much more directly embedded into the budget process this year versus kind of when we got the money last time with very little guidance and needing to do it at the very end. We're hoping to have a much more thorough detailed conversation with the council in this process. Perfect. Uh, and lastly, I, I do also want to just thank uh, Sabi and Mimi for their translation services. Um, I love, uh, Dave, that you highlight folks that have been working really hard and that we normally may not talk about or recognize in their efforts, but what they're doing is, is allowing uh, for a voice to be heard um, and for us to hear those voices uh, in our council meeting. So thank you so much for for um, highlighting them. And I wanna highlight my uh, the EMT, our firefighters who uh, did our, our vaccinations starting this last week. I decided to also do it and and uh, and it kicked my butt this week. <laughs> and, and I think it's because I, I had already contracted uh, uh, COVID and for folks who have, it might mean something a little differently. Um, but uh, Galvin Shirkun uh, was uh, the EMT who, uh, who uh, helped me. And so I just really want to thank him and all of our wonderful firefighters and EMTs that were working that day and volunteers. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Esparza. Thank you. Um, Council Member Arenas' uh, discussion prompted me to, I wanted to highlight a couple of things. One is I, um, agree the Latino community is also far under vaccinated. Um, and I think, you know, especially given the limitations that we're getting in vaccines, we're seeing people come from all over, continue to come from all over to different sites, even when we're trying to prioritize um, certain areas. And um, so I wanted to just amplify that, that that continue. Um, because we are not recovered until we are all recovered. Um, and I know folks are, some folks are very eager to open up, very eager to um, focus on um, other geographic areas when the areas that have been hardest hit by this pandemic um, continue to be under vaccinated. And that will not get better until the folks in those areas get their vaccines. And what we're seeing is, I, I do want to also appreciate the change in the language, not from the city, but from other folks. Um, there, there has been a change in the language because as soon as we opened up Eastridge, um, there were enormous lines. Um, and, and the desire, as I mentioned, just from calls to my office every single day, the desire is there. So people want to get vaccinated. And so I appreciate that that language has changed. And I also wanted to highlight um, the uh, Seven Trees and, uh, and Council Member Jimenez's area in, in Edenvale. Um, those are areas that folks aren't talking about. Um, they are the east side. <laughs> and, um, and I'm a little, I'm, I'm a very concerned because we've been pushing Andrew Hill and the need to open up Andrew Hill to offer vaccinations. I know that there's a clinic on Monterey Road that um, for their second doses, they were so overwhelmed, they moved to, um, I think it was Mount Pleasant High School. We need more locations in those areas that are hard hit, but the data, if we follow the data and follow the numbers, we can see that um, the cases are high and the vaccinations are low in those areas. Um, and lastly, I will leave with some good news um, which is uh, over the past week, um, my office has pitched in um, with efforts um, with by the county neighborhood services unit, county public health, um, and our nonprofit partners like Somos Mayfair um, have have gone in to housing development 
particularly Valley Palms, I know that there's a desire to do this in other areas, but have opened up Valley Palms to offer vaccinations. And that's not just to folks that lived in Valley Palms, they're actually trying to get folks, their circle, their friends and neighbors who are eligible in that area. So hopefully that will cover some of council member at NS's Welch Park um, folks, but the county actually went in, dropped a bunch of folks um, and, uh, and said, hey, we're gonna vaccinate everybody here who is eligible, who wants it. And again, it shows one more time that that place-based approach works. And so we need to continue to push that and not take our foot off the gas. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. If I, if I could, I just want to step in for just a quick second. And, and uh, Chief Sapien has got me the data on uh, the sworn personnel on the fire side percentages. There was a question from Council Member Cohen. So I just want to address that quickly. Um, of the 674 sworn personnel, 86% um, have completed both doses, and an additional 1% have had their first dose, 12% have declined, and then there's about a dozen folks who we don't have the status on, so 87% so uh, have their first or second dose, of which 80, full 86% have both doses, so we have a very high solid uh, vaccination rate uh, with our sworn personnel in fire. We'll stop. Thanks, Kip. Um, I, I regret asking you this question because uh, I, I know Chief may be, uh, again, attending to some other urgent issue, but do we have any sense of how many firefighters are out there, uh, or paramedics, I should say, assisting with vaccinations in terms of being pulled off the line? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I know we had capacity to do up to 90 at one yeah. point. Um, I'm not sure how many of those night, I think we might be rotating those folks through. So I don't know how many are pulled off the line at any one time, uh, but it's a, a pretty significant effort that we've been um, uh, uh, allocating to both the first responder clinic and now to the mobile clinic. And we expect that actually to continue to scale uh, and to be more over the coming weeks and months as we lend our support to those efforts. Yeah. It's something that we can follow up on. It, it, and our capacity was 93 weeks ago. Um, but as we said, we've we've trained, you know, up to 150 now. So the capacity for fire to actually help is greater. Um, but what the actual is, is, is something that we can follow up on. Yeah, I, um, well, I can take this offline. I really was interested in knowing. I, I know we want to do everything we can we, to help and we should. Want to know if it was having any impact on emergency medical response? Oh yeah, yeah. The the number, the ninety number I give was the estimate from Chief Sapien on what they could do without impacting their okay. other service response. And as as you know, they're very um, very strict on that kind of stuff. So the, yeah. the the feeling was that we could we could have ninety without impacting capacity, assuming no wildfire or large event that would be needed to pull them off. A lot of the capacity that we've given over to is uh, EMTs and paramedics that are not on shift. They're, they're either volunteering or doing it on an overtime basis right. um, from the county as well. Okay, thanks for all that information. Um, uh, thanks also again to Sabi and Mimi and to, uh, to everyone who's working so hard to help better connect us to the community. I should also uh, put a big thank you, by the way. Uh, Lee, you said 117 tons of trash. That's a lot of people working hard. Um, yeah. And it was some of those people who are working hard include people who are unhoused or working um, for nonprofits in partnership with us. So uh, I know I'm starting to see a noticeable improvement in terms of what I'm seeing out there. Uh, hopefully our residents are starting to see it too. It makes a big difference in how we feel about our city. Um, I wanted to just go to page five for a moment. Um, this slide, which I know we, I'm sorry, slide number five, I should say. Um, I, I know this is not the intention of that your intention at all, Kip, but I know that someone could read this slide as suggesting that our progress uh, through a pandemic is somewhat linear. And I'll never forget when Kurt Vonnegut came to speak at college uh, that I was attending, uh, you know, he, he said the great disappointment about adult life is that um, your life doesn't look anything like um, the stories that we write. Uh, and although uh, the stories tend to look an awful lot like a uh, you know, a, a straight line. Uh, Walter Mitty starts where he is and ends up where he is. Uh, in fact, life is much, much more sporadic and much, uh, much more challenging. And 
you know, we're certainly we've seen that through the spikes in this pandemic. And I'm very concerned about what we're starting to see now with variants, and we've been seeing it now for several weeks. 20 states seeing significant increases. Um, and as Sir Cody said, we're in a race between the vaccine and the variants. Are there things, you know, I, I appreciate very much Councilmember Rance's comments, you know, this is no time for us to be spiking the football. Um, beyond the same admonitions that we've been given everybody to wear a mask and socially distance and all those things, the things that we should be thinking about if we believed a another significant surge was coming. I don't think it'll be a spike like January, but assuming that there is a surge given the variants that have emerged, um, is there something different we should be doing now? A very good question. I'm, I'm, I, I too am one of those have been concerned for quite a while since we saw the emerge of the variants actually in the United Kingdom and we saw what happened in 12 weeks in the United Kingdom. The variants went from 0.05% of the uh, available or, or the, the general uh, coronavirus that was circulating to 80% within just a 12 week piece. And that accounted for them having to go back into uh, uh, effectively a full lockdown in, in the UK, even while they were doing some fairly restrictive measures. So the fact that this goes forward and goes backwards, yeah, it's, it's, it's not like a, a clean novel. It's, if anything, it's a bit more of a Gabriela Garcia Marquez <laughs> piece with with lots of magical realism built in um, and 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 uh, uh, complex things that happened 400 years ago that have that have effect today, right? So I, I I'm very concerned about the variants and the emergence of the variants, um, and I believe that this 12 week period is crucial. We're seeing a 20 percent increase overall in in the United States um, uh, over the last. Uh, week or so in terms of numbers of cases in Michigan and in the Midwest, you're seeing what is a full on surge already. Um, and this is actually what we've expected and have been worried about for uh, back actually since um, we got out of this last one starting to come down in, in January and February. So I do expect us to see uh, uh, be in a bit of a surge situation over the next uh, 12 to 18 weeks, um, even as we get the vaccines. Because most of the death, as you know, is with the elderly, the effect uh, getting the vaccines into our elderly is the most important thing that we need to do right now. Um, and that will have the effect of, even if we have an increase in cases, reducing the death rate significantly, because 80% of the death from this disease is in people 60 or older. So the, the most important thing to do differently is to double down on vaccine equity among our elderly and making sure that our Latino community, let, uh, Latinas, Latinos, um, Black community, um, and Native American community who are elders get those vaccines now, 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 so that if there is that surge, which we expect uh, to be hit by with the variants, that they will be at far less risk. Other than that, it really is a stay the course, um, with the exception of the new regulations around the double masking or the tighter masking. I'm really encouraging um, our folks and anybody uh, in our community to do the, the surgical mask and then the face mask over it. It's safer for you, it's safer for others. I think that's the significant difference, but the thing that we need to be really focusing on is vaccinations for our elderly right now, which will, which will put them out of harm's way for any surge that we see with the variants. It appears that all of the vaccines that are now in play are effective against the variants, and so we don't have that problem to worry about at this moment. So uh, you're right, it's not linear. And as we know, we can go back and we could very well go back again. All the more reason to, to double down on the equity issue as it relates to vaccines, especially with our elderly. Thanks, Kip. Um, an impressive citation of Garcia Marquez and other pandemic related literature. Um, I, I want to ask now about slide 14. And I guess the great um, risk of putting a draft document up in a slide is that somebody on my team is going to read it really carefully <laughs> and ask, well, what about this? And uh, sure enough, that's happened. Uh, this is a slide about the matrix at the different federal sources. And there's a suggestion that we would not be looking to, now this appears to be an incomplete document. I'm guessing you guys are still working on building it out. Yeah, well, but, we also dummied it up so that if you did that, that you wouldn't get all the yeah. data. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, then this may be a useless question, but uh, there's an implication from that incomplete document 
that we're not looking at FEMA reimbursement for emergency and transitional housing for burn house. Um, is there a sort of a conclusion or a decision on that, or is that something we're still looking at? No, it's, it's absolutely something we're still looking at, and we actually think we're going to be quite successful here. This, um, I know FEMA is listed here, but this is really, you know, the, the bandwidth that we brought in with, with Ernst & Young, separate from just kind of helping set up the accounting and, and some of how we would be audited, is their expertise around some of these different pots. And so, you know, Widow Brian and, and Ray and Jay are very familiar with FEMA. We're still on a lot of these programs seeking FEMA reimbursement and have early applications in on an awful lot of it. This exercise is really, you know, what we didn't get to do early on in the response when we got the, the coronavirus relief funds early on, we relied on those because those came in first. Um, and then we had less restrictive money at the very end. So this is trying to put forward ideas and, and pots of money that are more restrictive and go after those first. So then we have the more flexible dollars later on. Um, okay. But FEMA is absolutely, absolutely still part of that equation. Okay, I actually didn't ask the question properly. I meant to say emergency and transitional housing communities, specifically the structures that we're building. Um, is that, I know there are some issues because obviously the structures last much longer than the pandemic. Uh, are we sort of assuming that FEMA is not a likely source for that? So I would say, you know, we've been told with FEMA and the, I can say the, the conversations that we had with FEMA in the fall versus the conversations that we're having today are night and day. They're drastically different. So I would say we're more hopeful around FEMA recovering or covering um, maybe not all, but a portion of those, especially some of the wraparound services and things that go along with that and some initial um, setup versus where we were, you know, in the fall. So I, I think we're we're in a better place, um, but that's still being worked out. Okay, thanks, Lee. Uh, and then um, I understand with Resilience Corps, you guys are already out hiring using FEMA reimbursement um, for a couple of categories, at least with regard to vac supporting vaccinations, is that right? Correct, yeah, the vaccination um, line of the Re Resiliency Corps um, will be 100% um, reimbursable. So we're able to, to, to step into that relatively quickly and we have early paperwork being developed right now with FEMA for that. Okay, appreciate Jeff Russers and everybody's work on that effort. All right, well, thank you for all the information. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Not, we will move forward um, to the next item on the agenda. Uh, that is item 3.3, which is uh, an audit. Um, advocate referrals, further improvements in processes and data sharing can help connect more survivors to services. I believe Joe is with us, as is uh, hopefully someone with SJPD. And welcome, Joe. Good afternoon, Joe Roy, City Auditor. I am here with Allison Pauly. Bella Obi and Juan Barragon from my office. And I believe Ali is going to share her screen with our uh, short slide deck. Here we go. So we're here to present our audit advocate referrals, further improvements to processes and data sharing can help connect more survivors to services. And so the objective of this audit was to assess protocols for and timeliness of uh, community advocate referrals for survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, child abuse and child sexual abuse and human trafficking. In the state of California, survivors of certain crimes have a right to have an advocate present with them during interviews with law enforcement or defense attorneys. These advocates can provide a broad range of services to a survivor, such as explaining information about the criminal process, communicating with prosecution or law enforcement, helping them find safe housing or transportation, connecting them to further resources or support from other agencies. Law enforcement plays a role in notifying survivors about their rights and referring them to advocate services. In the San Jose Police Department, patrol officers provide resource cards to survivors and may connect them with a crisis hotline or ask if they want to be contacted by an advocate. Later, detectives may also provide resources by advocates to a survivor. Police Department works with YWCA Silicon Valley to provide advocacy services for survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Community Solutions for Children, Families, and Individuals provides advocacy services for survivors of human trafficking. Santa Clara County's Department of Family and Children's Services takes the lead on working with families for child abuse cases. We had three findings in the report. 
First, we found that updates to internal processes would help connect survivors to advocates. The police department provides information about advocacy services throughout an investigation, which allows for multiple opportunities for officers or detectives to connect survivors to advocates. In our report, we include process flows demonstrating how a survivor may be connected with an advocate. The information in this slide may be difficult to read, but we wanted to show the redundancy in the process. As the response to an incident and related investigation unfolds, the green boxes in the slide indicate different steps in the process where some form of advocate referral or connection to services may be occurring, including when a survivor is given information about advocate services. As I just noted, there are redundancies in the process to ensure there are multiple opportunities to connect survivors with advocates. However, we found that the duty manual does not explicitly include guidance as the police department's duty manual, include guidance to offer advocacy services before any interview. Doing so would align better with Santa Clara County protocols and other jurisdictions that we surveyed. In addition, resource cards reference the right to an advocate, but would be more helpful with further information and should be fully available in Spanish and Vietnamese. Finally, standardizing the process for how detectives refer victims of sexual assault to advocates could help advocates reach more survivors. So to help more connect more survivors with advocates, we recommended that the department update internal processes to match county guidance and standardized referrals and revise and fully translate resource cards into Spanish and Vietnamese. In our second finding, we found that the police department provides additional resources for survivors of high-risk domestic violence cases. To identify and respond to high-risk domestic violence cases, the department uses a, uses a lethality assessment in a high-risk response team. For cases assessed as high-risk, officers are expected to call an advocate hotline and offer to connect the survivor directly to an advocate at the scene. For the most dangerous situations, advocates with the high-risk response team will respond in person or as was the case during the COVID-19 pandemic has been done virtually. We found that between September 2019 and November 2020, roughly 1,700 domestic violence instances, domestic violence incidents were deemed high risk through the lethality assessment. Only a portion of high risk cases received a response from the high risk response team. And there were 45 or such responses between September 2019 and mid November 2020. The high risk response team is operating as a pilot program, which is expected to run through the end of fiscal year 2020, 2021. Upon completion of the pilot, the city's advocate partner, YWCA, is expected to conduct an evaluation of the program. We recommend the department work with YWCA in its evaluation of the high risk response team program, including assessing the criteria used to activate the team and reviewing the level of service provided to survivors and whether additional involvement with other agencies is warranted. In our last finding, we found that better data sharing will allow the police department to assess referral timeliness and other areas of performance. Both the police department and its advocate partners collect data that can be useful for assessing the timeliness and utilization of services. However, the sharing of data can be improved on both sides to allow for better understanding of how well the current system performs. We found that YWCA's database that took that shows that it took the police department on average three days in June 2020 to provide YWCA with a lethality assessment for domestic violence incidents. Unfortunately, this information is not included in the data that is currently shared with the department, nor does the department track it themselves. The data provided on sexual assault advocate referrals is limited, and the department does not regu regularly receive data from its advocate partner community solutions for human trafficking advocate referrals. Finally, the department the police department can provide domestic violence and sexual assault summary reports to YWCA to cross-reference against client lists to ensure all consenting survivors have been contacted. So we recommend that, that to better assess referral timeliness and utilization of advocate services, the department should work with its advocate partners on what data can be shared between the agencies. Lastly, we found that data can help the department target outreach to educate the community about advocate services. As shown on these maps, the number of reported domestic violence incidents and the percentage of survivors who agree to a referral varies across the city. We recommend that the department work with community partners to expand outreach and education to targeted communities. So our report contains six recommendations. We'd like to thank the San Jose Police Department, YWCA Silicon Valley, Community Solutions for Children, Families, and Individuals, City Manager's Office of Racial Equity and Santa Clara County's Department of Family Children's Services for their time and insight during the operating process. We ask that you accept the report. And with that, I would like to turn it over to the department for the administration's response. I'm not exactly sure who's here. I believe it's either Lieutenant Jimenez or Lieutenant Donahue or one of the other lieutenants. 
will be providing the response and we'll be available to answer any questions. Thanks, Joe. Who'd like to speak for San Jose PD? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Brian Anderson with the Special Victims Unit. And on behalf of the San Jose Police Department's administration and Lieutenant Rob Lang of the Family Violence Unit, Lieutenant Jaime Jimenez of the Sexual Assaults Investigation Unit, and myself, we would like to thank Joe Royce of the City Auditor's Office and his staff for the review of advocate referrals. The audit of advocate referrals was inclusive, thorough, and conducted with the utmost professionalism. And the police department agrees with all six recommendations found within the audit report. These six recommendations will ensure the highest levels of support and services for survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, child sexual abuse, and human trafficking. We will look forward to implementing these best practices and increasing the collaboration between our department, community partners, and advocacy services. Recommendation two has been implemented and recommendations one, three, four, five, and six are all currently being worked on with the implementation goals of June and December of 2021. Lieutenant Lang and myself are available for any questions regarding the impl implementation of the recommendations. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, okay, let's, um, let's go to members of the community first and we'll come back to council. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Paul Soto. Um, well, I I want to I want to believe that the police department is in fact committed to those principles and those values with respect to human beings that have experienced that that taking of their power, feeling vulnerable, feeling uh, helpless, feeling powerless, feeling um, like you're not going to be believed. And to, that is not my experience. And I brought this to this council that it was not my experience a couple of weeks ago. I was evicted from a home because of my response to a sexual assault that I experienced. The police department proceeded to convince me that I misunderstood what happened. And I still failed to and I asked, I asked the officer, I said, on what basis are you making that? On what, what reference point do you have to make an assessment that I misunderstood? You weren't there. You don't even know what happened, but yet you're going to make a judgment call like that? I was the, the, the dehumanization that I experienced with respect to my, uh, my abuser was compounded by the response by the San Jose Police Department. Men that I called in order to protect me, they victimized me. This is not uncommon. And while I respect the police department, its job and its duty, I expect the best out of you. You got, a San, you got an SJPD badge on you, man. You're representing San Ho. That means my expectations for you are high, extremely high. And I demand nothing but the best from you. And when you fail, when you fail in that endeavor, and you do something dehumanize me after that just happened to me, you're gonna hear it from me. Thank you. The person with the, the phone number ending 5140. Yeah, I, I'd like to know if you guys are really gonna care because I've never met so many uncaring people working for an organization in San Jose PD. I mean, the shoulder shrugs, the, <sighs> as you guys, you know, need to take a report on something, uh, you know, for things that are really minor, you don't, you know, minor crimes and things, you, you, you don't seem to care. You don't want to come out, you know, someone's sleeping in the car out in my neighborhood here, homeless person takes you guys, you know, an hour to come out. It's like, how are we going to be able to trust you when there's certain when things are really serious, like sexual assault and human trafficking and, and these kind of things? I, I just don't see it in your department. I see a lot of PR and eyewash and, you know, a lot of feel good stuff. But, you know, when you really have to deal with someone from San Jose Police Department, it's it's really horrible. I mean, or it's just if if they're not smug or arrogant, 
it's like this fakeness. I mean, are you trying out for a TV show? It's just, I, I don't see it. I, I like to see in six months or a year, if people had a positive experience of San Jose PD helping them. I don't think the word help is in your vocabulary in San Jose PD. The only thing that's in your vocabulary is, do you want to go to jail? Uh, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. We'll be there in an hour. It's just, you guys are a terrible department. I hate to say it, but like Paul Soto says, you know, he has high expectations. I'm the opposite. I have the lowest expectations for San Jose PD. I, matter of fact, I can't think of anyone I know who's had a positive experience with, with that police department. I think maybe I had one in my whole life. The rest, what a bunch of jerks. Thanks. Councilmember Arenas. Councilmember, you're muted right now. Of course I am. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. I was uh, saying that I wanted to thank our police department um, as they have uh, shown me in the last couple of years, um, just the changes that they uh, are committed to in making sure that our survivors of sexual assault um, have the best interface with our, our police officers. Um, nobody wants to interact with the police department when some, you know, in under these circumstances, but when you do, um, they, uh, they are trained to, to treat you with, um, uh, victim and trauma informed, uh, uh, care. And, um, they're continuously working on their, um, standard operating, uh, procedures to make sure that they offer the best um, the best service that we can, and so I I want to uh, I want to say that right from the start, um, and uh, and also because we we just had a caller that that I I think you know um, doesn't really reflect I think for the most part what our residents uh, believe about our police department, uh, nor what I, what I believe about our police department. Um, and I also like to thank uh, Captain Trayer, who's not on the call today, but he supported um, Paul, um, who uh, the resident who called in, um, and and really walked him through all all the way through um, that incident that he referred to, as well as um, uh, Chief Tyndall. And so I want to thank them uh, for really overextending themselves in, to to make in making sure that regardless of gender that our survivors are supported. So I'm gonna get that right off um, uh, right off the bat and then just move into this really great audit that, um, that once again, Joe, I, I think I say the same thing. I probably sound like a broken record, but um, you really always come through with our audits um, and allow us to uh, improve our policies because of the product that you give us and the, the type of analysis that you give us. And I, I, and I just wanna share with the rest of my council colleagues who are in my Brown Act, um, who supported um, and we together uh, submitted a, a memo um, that that really triggered a lot of these changes that you're seeing now. So I know this was about two years ago, um, uh, and a lot of really good work sometimes happens really slowly, um, so that we make sure that it's quality work. Um, but we've been chipping away at this, uh, and so I just want to thank my uh, council colleagues, which is uh, Councilmember Foley. Davis, Esparza, and Carrasco for signing on with me, uh, for supporting our survivors, of course. I know the rest of our colleagues are just as supportive, uh, but our Brown Act uh, limits us to five. So what we're seeing today is a lot of uh, um, standard operating procedures that are being implemented and that are being improved because of this audit. Um, I, we've already gone through this, this particular audit under our public safety strategic um, committee. And so I've asked some of these questions before, I'm not gonna ask them again. 
uh, we've had a really good conversation. I was able to vet a lot of uh, the recommendations and the responses. And so I'm just gonna follow up on some of the items that we talked about um, at PISFIS, uh, at our public safety committee, uh, so that way I'm, I can close the loop on some of these things. So on recommendation number six, I had recommended for us to include um, next door. This is the police department should expand work with community partners for outreach about, about advocacy services and crime prevention targeting communities disproportionately affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, sexual abuse, and human trafficking have or that have low uh, lower utilization of advocacy services. And so um, the department agrees. Uh, you were working on an MOU with YWCA, I think Aki and Step Forward. Um, and so I wondered if you were able to include next door. I think I'm gonna turn that one over to Lieutenant Lane because I think he's been working with the next door. Hi, uh, this is Lieutenant Rob Lang here. Um, we we are in the in the process of working with them. We do not have uh, anything finalized at this time, but that's something that uh, uh, when uh, Chief Tyndall was in our in the chief position, it's something that we started working on, and it's something that we're going to work continue to work on under Chief Mata. Thank you. Um, I also want to just give a quick update to our colleagues about. Uh, the joint work that we've been doing with the county, we've met with the county for about, uh, I think, uh, twice before, and we talked about, uh, we focused on sexual assault and domestic violence, survivors in the process and how we can improve, how we have system improvements and support for these survivors. And one of the things that came out of this is um, that uh, we needed to have a better coordination with our service providers. And this is the reason why I was asking this question is that some of the providers have MOUs with our uh, San Jose Police Department because we have a contract with them. But if we don't have a contract, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't partner with these folks. And so um, part, part of the, the work is, is making sure that we're all uh, uh, having really clear communication. Um, and one of the things that we are going to talk about um, later on this month, and you're all invited to the third joint meeting with our county to talk about uh, and really close the loop on uh, on the sexual assault, domestic violence, and human trafficking conversation that we've been having, the coordination um, that we've been uh, working on in the last couple of years. Um, one of the things that we want to know, that I wanted to know in, in getting ready for that is uh, we talked about some of the uh, the referral information from the county um, that uh, that is part of the bill of the sexual bill of rights. Have you connected? Have you been able to connect with the county regarding uh, the card and maybe some of the exams that are part of the the sexual bill of rights and part of, uh, and somewhat related to this audit because it's included in here. I know that uh, Lieutenant uh, Jimenez has been in contact with the county. I believe Lieutenant Lang has also been in contact with the county also. I'll let him follow up in regards to any specifics on his end with uh, the Family Balance Unit. Okay. Hey, yeah. Hi, this is Lieutenant Lang again. Yes, so um, we reached out. We're in the process of um, updating the domestic violence protocol for the county, and there's a, a whole bunch of entities that work together on that. That's something that I brought up with that group as far as modifying the domestic violence cards that are handed out, getting those fully translated instead of partially translated into the three main languages in our area and changing some of the language in that. The, the group is, we're at the beginning phases of updating that protocol that was warmly received when I brought that topic up. So I believe that's gonna go, but that is a county form that will take a little bit of time to make happen. But I, I believe based on the initial conversations, I think that that's gonna be something that's achievable. Great, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I think the, the other item um, uh, that I wanted to ask about is, um, I know that, that you've accepted all of these recommendations and I really appreciate that. Um, not only did you accept the recommendations, but I think in conjunction to some of the um, 
manual duty changes that were um, approved last year, you, uh, you you did this like overhaul really of procedural improvements um, that include that include um, uh, standard operating procedures and then also duty manual changes that are related to sexual assault. And so I just want our my colleagues really, um, if, if you haven't read the, the report in depth, but to recognize that there's been just a tremendous amount of work that's being um, done by our police department and by our investigative units, um, as well as some, some um, uh, coordination of resources and the way that you've uh, separated uh, SIU and uh, SVU um, so that there could be kind of an even workload or at least a um, oh, um, uh, workload that makes sense to you um, and that can, can ultimately hopefully uh, have a higher closure rate for our survivors. In the end, that's what we really want to, to see is a higher closure rate for our survivors. So I wanted to ask if there are any resources that that you are um, in need of, and of course we're always in need of resources. But there, is there anything that's real pivotal that um, that we should share with our city manager um, and colleagues at this point, and um, and our mayor? Well, that's a big question. Um, <clears throat> like all city departments, uh, we're you know obviously in need of resources. Uh, some of the recommendations that we did put forward for data informed responses uh, in a more real time fashion was um, the crime prevention specialist and the analyst position uh, within our units um, support. So, uh, you know, moving forward, obviously, we'll, we'll continue to, you know, press uh, for those requests um, and they've been put forward already and we'll see. Where, where that goes, but that would be first and uh, foremost, you know, at the moment. Right. Um, and so you know, th this is a lot of um, work that has been done by um, uh, your department um, and as well as Jennifer McGuire. I also want to thank you um, because she's always been just so pivotal in making sure that this work continues to progress regardless of um, some changes um, with our captains and, and uh, deputy chiefs as they uh, advance in their own careers. Um, we've been able to have um, uh, Jennifer supporting us uh, throughout this whole um, time. So I really wanna thank Jennifer. And I wonder if we can maybe get an MBA, uh, Dave, or I don't know if Jennifer is on here, uh, to make sure that all of the recommendations that are um, uh, that are uh, outlined in this audit and that our police department have accepted can actually take place. And if it means, you know, maybe adding some resources, uh, then, then hopefully we, we can actually do that. But we need to understand what those resources are. Yeah, thank you, council member. So we can look at either an MBA or info memo just to kind of get back and, and, and um, summarize uh, what, what we can accomplish here. So that's not a problem. Perfect. And, and just for my colleagues, uh, you know, one of the things that, that I think I've shared with you um, in the past, but I'll, I'll do it once again, is just the, the, the high number of, of sexual assaults that happen to our children under the age of 12. And then um, I think it's the second highest is under the age of 16. And so when you think about sexual assaults, uh, we might think about adults and adults in intimate partner um, relationships. But the reality is that a lot of these sexual assaults happen to our children. And so um, because they, they happen to our children, it involves a whole family unit and we must uh, be able to support our uh, investigative units in a way that can help advance their cases, that can help advance the closure rates. Um, and I just see uh, a lot of that happening in these uh, system improvements that have been done, not only uh, due to this audit, but uh, uh, previously to all the work that we've been doing um, simply by um, connecting with our, our county counterparts and, and just all the hard work that you've all been doing um, and one of the, the things that, uh, one of the data points that we have noticed is that um, there is an underreporting, it seems, 
like there's an underreporting for um, our Asian subgroups. Um, and that is uh, also something to, to worry about it, equally um, in terms of either being overrepresented or underrepresented. It just means that there's something there that we need to figure out how to reach out to survivors and families um, in order for them to go through either the process of reporting or simply to, to get some support. And so I just wanna thank you all for all the really good work that you're doing every day on this. Um, and, um, and once again, uh, thank you, Joe, for, for the audit. I'd like to um, move uh, the report. Um, and then uh, Dave, should I include that EPA in, in this? Uh, yes, you could, uh, Council Member. Just want a little bit of flexibility, whether it's an MBA or info memo, to be able to provide that response. Okay, so uh, either a, uh, and then included in the motion is a is a request for an MBA or info memo to address the recommendations within the audit. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Council Member Mahan. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks for the report and, and work here. I, I just wanted to ask to, to what extent we've examined use of technology to help uh, create greater kind of support and access to information for survivors. I was looking at the resource cards and I, I noticed on one in, in the full report, uh, not the presentation, but in the report, there's a QR code on one that takes you to the DA's website and just kind of curious you know, is there, are there, if we looked at best practices or any information around using text messaging, for example, I can imagine a hotline where you have to actually dial a number and talk to a person on the other side might be higher barrier for some folks. And I'm, I'm just curious how much we've explored use of digital assets um, and or, you know, other technology to kind of lower barriers for folks. That's a, that's a great question. And we're actually always continually looking at different ways to uh, outreach to the community. Uh, we've been uh, currently working with uh, doing uh, API, Asian Pacific Islander outreach, and looking at specifically exactly what you're talking about is where is the best place to send people for information. And so we're continually looking at uh, doing social media um, campaigns along with, uh, you know, we're working on a billboard campaign and also um, in conjunction with that, um, uh, electronic media is basically connecting with people's phones and advertising. And in those regards, you know, where do you send them once you reach, reach them with that advertising? And we're working closely with the South Bay Coalition and Human Trafficking uh, in regards to setting up a specific uh, site at their website where you'll have all the different options of being able to call the, the police department, the human trafficking hotline, uh, Polaris project, uh, many of the different options in case survivors uh, or those that wish to uh, report uh, trafficking or sexual assault activity um, can be comfortable with the best avenue in which to report it. So uh, we are, and we're continuing to, and we continue to uh, look at the best practices and the best avenues for people to report. Great, that, that sounds good. And thanks, Brian. And do we know if, is text messaging a tool that's being used? And is that something we're actually looking at as well? I didn't see it anywhere in the report, which kind of surprised me. Yes, text messaging has been used, not, uh, not necessarily specifically in the human trafficking avenue with San Jose Police Department, but tech, we have actually done a rescue, uh, out-of-state rescue, which actually was made the, the media was actually a fairly um, big case for our human trafficking team, where the survivor texts the, I believe it's the Polaris Project, one of the sexual, uh, one of the human trafficking hotlines. Uh, while she was being trafficked. So she was in the hotel room being kept there and she was texting that, uh, you know, she wanted help and we were able to respond and rescue her. So that that avenue is also being uh, utilized. Right, and is there a plan to include that avenue on the resource card so people are aware of it or, or how would people know? That, I mean, that is an excellent idea. Um, and we'll most definitely take a look at how we can incorporate uh, text messaging along with that outreach. 
Great. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm asking because it's just, it's so ubiquitous. So many people have devices. It's kind of on your person. Typically it's, it's real time. It's lower barrier. It just, it seems promising. I can also imagine some risks and I'm certainly not an expert, but just thought I would, I would kind of highlight the, the text as a, as a potential communication channel. So glad to hear you're thinking about it. And that's, that was my only question. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Sparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, then I, I believe the uh, texting has been uh, available um, on this. I don't know how long, but uh, I do know that it is available. Um, I, I actually just really wanted to um, make some quick comments. Council Member Arenas thanked the PD, and the PD um, has done a tremendous amount of work on this. Our advocates have done a huge amount of work on this. Um, partnering with the county, um, our, you know, that partnership has really um, made some big advances. Uh, but because she didn't say it, I'm going to say it. I'd like to thank Councilmember Arenas for her tremendous leadership on this. Um, I know she thanked um, all of our female colleagues on the board, um, but really it's been her leadership on this that has led to uh, sustained um, systemic improvements on this. And I just wanted to call that out because we all, we all have our areas where we have provided leadership and this has really, really been the result of council member at NS just not letting up and continuing to push. Um, and she gets in there and I, I know for a fact how often she meets with the advocates um, and it's very much appreciated. Our city is better off for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to echo uh, the thanks to Councilmember Ranch for her longstanding leadership on this issue, uh, and thank uh, Joe and Sanjay PD uh, for your work on this. Um, Joe, I, I didn't see that the DA's office was reached out to. I saw the list of organizations, and and was that. Was there, is that intentional or is that just, I mean, you know, I know you're trying to do a lot of things and your team's got to talk to a lot of folks. I'm going to defer, Allie, did we talk with uh, the DA? I can't remember because I know we did talk with some folks over at the county. We did talk with, this is Allison Pauly from the city auditor's office. We did talk with some folks over the county. We didn't specifically reach out to the DA. My understanding is the police department's been working closely with them on things like the resource cars and how to update okay. those. It wasn't a specific reason that we didn't it was yeah. like you said kind of just on kind of what was on our work plan yeah i got it i understand there's there's an unlimited universe of folks to try to talk to the reason why i mentioned that is just on the resource cards um, I, I actually learned quite a bit from this i appreciate it because i used to prosecute sexual assault cases about 15 years ago and the laws have changed and i think that uh law about notification of um a victim advocate uh was something that emerged just in recently in 2018. So I appreciate that. I went back and looked at the law. Um, the law uh, allows um, and entitles folks to um, request both uh, somebody like a WCA, uh, YWCA rape crisis counselor, as well as a quote unquote support person uh, to be present. and. My concern with the resource card is that it doesn't make reference to the exclusion in the state law under 679.04 in the penal code that a support person could be excluded where it's detrimental to the purpose of the interview. And the reason why I mentioned that is as someone who, you know, I assume the language is in the state law for a reason. And, you know, in my experience, I've prosecuted cases where mothers testified against their children who were survivors of sexual assault. I had best friends testify that the 15 year old victim of sexual assault was a complete liar. You know, the quote unquote support person is not always a reliable person <laughs> who has the best interest of the victim at heart. In the case of the, the 15 year old, the, the best friend happened to be running in the same gang as the assailant did. And so I think it's important that I mean, the police and the DA be able to have the ability to discern what's going on in that situation and say to the support person, I'm sorry, you have to step outside so we can have a, a conversation. Um, and so the, the, the support card doesn't actually 
contain any reference to that. And so I would just ask, you know, if we're going to be using this language that we just check in with the DA's office so they've had a chance to view the penal code sections and so forth and really make sure that the rights that we're informing folks are are really fully informed by what's there in the law. I, I know that may seem like a small issue, but I've had enough cases where I've been, you know, having to shake my head thinking, God, I can't believe, you know, this survivor was betrayed by that person who was so close to them. Uh, it unfortunately is more often the case than you'd like to believe. Um, so I, I just ask that Lieutenant Anderson might consider that as, as you're using these cards. Yes, it, as you know, Mayor, uh, lo, all these decisions and changes are, are made in a vacuum and there's a lot of really good people with well intentions uh, and very knowledgeable that go into making any changes like this with the county. So there are several committees that will weigh in that uh, involve uh, other police departments in the county along with the DA's office and along with our uh, NGOs and CBOs and um, also other county partners. So we most definitely will check in with the DA's office regarding that. Okay, thanks, Lieutenant. And then I saw on page four that the high-risk program for SJPD um, runs out, the pilot program runs out in June. Is that is that a budgetary issue or why, why does that pilot terminate? Hi, Mr. Mayor. This is uh, Lieutenant Rob Lang from Family Violence Unit. Yes, uh, to answer your question, the, the funding was initially for the pilot program. We've extended it through the end of the fiscal year. We've requested funds for next fiscal year. So um, that, that is all in the works to try to continue that program. But the, the extension from the pilot programs C state and the end of the fiscal year that that's been plugged in. We're working on it for next year as far as the funding. Okay, great. Thanks, Lieutenant. All right, thank you. Appreciate all the information and uh, all the work on uh, improving our response uh, to help survivors. All right, any other questions? Not. Let's vote on the motion of Council oh, Member. Mayor, I'm so sorry. I'm, I I didn't realize, and I'm uh, being very rude. Um, we all, I, I do also want to um, thank uh, uh, Lieutenant Anderson. I, I, you know, we connect and I'm, I'm <laughs> directly speaking with you and I apologize for, for not recognizing that and, and for everybody else who's been working on this. Um, I think Lieutenant Jimenez has uh, just recently been added to the team. Um, and then, of course, Anjali, who is your analyst, who has stretched beyond belief and the reason why we probably need more resources so we can actually take a look in real time um, to the trends that are happening um, and be able to respond to them instead of looking back, which is what we've been able to do because of her, but we, we need to be more proactive and, and take a look at those trends and, and respond to them, in, like I said, in real time. So thank you so much for the work, Lieutenant. You're welcome, thank you. All right, uh, let's vote now on Councilmember Reyes's motion. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Item 8.1 is the amendment to council policy 7-1, a below market rental policy for use of city owned land and buildings by qualified organizations for governmental or other public purposes. Mayor Nancy Klein, economic development, uh, Kevin Ice and I have just a little bit to share. Um, the policy uh, came to us as uh, uh, some of the work of the auditor. And they were looking, auditor was looking how to strengthen our 7-1 policy. And Kevin will review with you what we've been working on with the auditor to do just that. And then we'll be available for questions. Kevin? Thanks, Nancy. Hi, Kevin Ice, uh, manager with Real Estate Services. Uh, so the 7-1 policy governs the city's below market rate leases uh, with nonprofit, charitable, quasi-public or governmental entities. Uh, the 71 policy provides that qualified organizations can lease property from the city for as little as $1 per month 
in exchange for providing maintenance to the occupied facility. The policy provides an opportunity to utilize space that may not be positioned to compete for top dollar on the open market in order to serve the community. Reporting obligations are designed for the city to ensure that the community benefits are continuing to be realized while the space is occupied at a below market rate and the expectation that the tenants maintain their space in exchange for their rental rates ensures that the leases aren't a large drain on city resources. There are a few elements of the current 7-1 policy that don't align with how the program has played out. Uh, the policy is written to limit below market leases to under a year. In reality, our 7-1 tenants are typically long-term established community groups. And it's neither practical nor desirable to revoke their leases after such a short term. All 7-1 leases are currently on a month to month term as a result of this provision, and this can provide a challenge securing grant funding for our tenants. An additional challenge with the policy is that much of the annual reporting requirements are onerous for our nonprofit tenants and not applicable for our governmental agency tenants. For example, certified financial reports are an expensive burden for nonprofit groups to provide annually, and governmental agencies cannot provide details about their board of directors because that isn't how they're set up. So that's a little about what policy 7-1 is. Uh, now a few things that it's not. Uh, it does not apply to the Neighborhood Center Partner Program, uh, formerly called Reuse Sites, uh, which leases out space in community centers. Policy 712 applies to those leases and 7-1 has no bearing um, on those facilities. 7-1 does not apply to leasing out city parkland. Uh, policy 7-8 governs those agreements. Uh, and policy 7-1 is not ap applicable for a facility if there are conflicting legal obligations, commitments, or council direction. And for example, policy 631 uh, prevents a below market lease on regional wastewater facility lands. So here are a few of our current 7-1 tenants, groups like Act for Mental Health, OXA, African American Community Service Agency, the Alviso Post Office, San Jose Conservation Corps, Empire Gardens Elementary School, and UICHI. And just so to, oh, go ahead, Kevin, I'm sorry. Staff recommends that council adopt the amended policy 7-1. Uh, key changes in our amendments address comments from audit report 0804, which noted that the long-term occupancies under 7-1 leases were at odds with the short-term nature of the policy as it was written and the amended policy now allows for long-term leases. The existing policy allows for lease termination to be either no cause with 90 days notice or when a city uh, need arises that conflicts with ongoing leasing of the facility. Uh, the amended policy preserves these terms, but also provides that the city can end the arrangement if it's determined that a tenant is no longer providing community benefit. Changes to the policy address potential inconsistencies with state surplus law and overall uh, reporting obligations were streamlined uh, to account for the different needs of the different types of qualified organizations, uh, whether it's nonprofit, quasi-public or a public entity, and it provides staff discretion to collect information as necessary to ensure an ongoing public benefit. And Nancy? I just wanted to highlight the two main things that are most help to our tenants are being able to deal with the term and then to streamline the reporting obligations. And we've talked uh, with the auditor at great length about that. And this policy amendment achieves those goals. And thank you very much. And we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. And thanks, Kevin, for that very clear uh, presentation. Uh, let's go to the public. Um, Paul Soto. Paul, you're muted. Oh, I think we lost you. Paul, you want to try that again? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. The, um... Two, two items on there that are of concern of mine, and, and we have to get used to challenging the laws 
because the laws, every single one of them, every single one of the laws and ordinances that we have installed at the city, county, and state level are all infected with white supremacy, racism, discrimination, marginalization, all of it. That's the definition of institutionalized racism. Okay, now, what it's going to take is to be able to look at these standards that come up and be able to pinpoint where you're going to excise that virus that is embedded within the institutionalized racism. The examples that I identify here are the short-term rentals, uh, the, the short-term leases, and the city park uh, restriction. That what I'm asking for is that, especially with respect to the city park, one of the main uh, one of the main uh, means by which redlining and all the discriminatory practices was instituted into the city uh, government was parks and recreation. They were the main soldiers by ensuring and, and drawing out those lines, all the park allocations, and excluding explicitly my ancestors. And so with respect to a nonprofit, it, well, it just stands the reason, with, well, what is a nonprofit? A nonprofit represents a resource within the community that bears the weight that the city or the county cannot. Is that not equity? Thus, that's a redlining policy with the city parks uh, restriction. I'm asking if that could be lifted and the short-term uh, rental lifted. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Beekman? Hi, uh, this seems to be about uh, nonprofit agencies and uh, you mentioned work, uh, their work in uh, North San Jose area. Um, just a quick reminder of the work that I'm just trying to do and, and remind yourselves of, of uh, the goodness of uh, mixed income into our future. There's different ways to incorporate those practices and uh, I hope uh, you're figuring how those how to exactly do that. I think mixed, un mixed income to respect VLI and ELI is uh, incredibly important and interesting for our future and good luck on how to do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, back to the council, Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a couple of questions. I wanna thank um, Nancy and Kevin for the presentation, but also Kevin, thank you for working with my office on on some of the questions I had earlier in the week. Um, wanted to ask two things. First, the Empire Gardens Elementary School. It looks like that is actually park grounds, so I'm not clear on why this is falling under seven one as opposed to seven eight. Kevin, you want to jump on that one? And this is based on the spreadsheet that you gave me with the tenant information, and I very much appreciate that spreadsheet. Yeah, so that is a um, that's a lease that we have with the school district, and that allowed them to put in a, a park area, and the city gets some co-benefit out of that. Um, so I don't think it's a traditional park space that would trigger uh, the need for 78 to apply to it. Okay, um, I've, I'm probably gonna ask you a little bit more offline about that because sure. we, ha we have something similar in my district uh, and there is no agreement whatsoever. And this is uh, the Sherman Oaks playground and on, um, it's not city owned property, it's actually on their the school property. Um, and so maybe we could talk about how this might work in reverse as well. Um, so that's what triggered that question for me. And then the other question is, there's nothing in the, um, there's nothing in the amendments about the lease amount, but I did see that the, the base rent that is being charged is very different for a couple of uh, the, the lessees. And in particular, uh, the African American Community Services Agency is paying quite a bit more than um, the other nonprofits like Act for Mental Health, the Conservation Corps, and the UKI, uh, UIKI Japanese American Community Senior Service. And I'm wondering why that is and whether that will be rectified when 
the long-term leases are um, negotiated with the lessees. Yes, Council Member, great question. Thank you. Um, OXA is an unusual case in our um, portfolio of tenants. In, within the space they are, they're the only tenant which we allow to have subtenants. And they're, they're, uh, they receive dollars from the subtenants, which helps them earn the dollars to maintain their programs as well as the building. And at the time uh, when the lease went into effect uh, quite a bit ago, uh, that was the amount established at that point. And thank you for the question, Kevin and I are uh, already chatting about when an extension happens that we can certainly modify that to a lower amount. But there, there was at the time looking at the notes uh, uh, some logic into the additional work that goes with staff, also double checking um, and coordinating those subtenants. Thank you. I I appreciate that. It just seemed like the um, the square footage that they're renting versus the square footage of some of the other tenants. Um, what I guess whether or not I didn't know that they had other subtenants, um, and maybe that's something that's a, a mitigating factor it just seemed like really out of whack with the other with the other um amounts so i'm not sure will you be looking at the rental amounts for all of the tenants of the different properties in general the the goal will be to keep uh, at a very low amount. Again, we, we don't want to be a burden. We want to, in effect, having those tenants do services that the city would either do or would want to see done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Those are all my questions. Um, I'm happy to move approval. Second. All right. Second, Councilman Rennes. Councilman Cohen? Yeah. I just want to ask a question. What is there a substantive, uh, some kind of, um, substantive change to the kinds of organizations that would qualify under these changes in the policy or the, as a policy, is most of the changes clean up on language? I, I just wanna understand if there's any material effect on the kinds of groups that might qualify for this kind of um, below market rate rental based on the changes we're making. The type of uses are pretty consistent or are in fact consistent, Councilmember Member Cohn. Okay, I mean that's what I thought. I, I'm just trying to, because I would read through all the changes, make you know, make sure I didn't miss something about whether there was a significant change in the policy or if it's you know trying to clarify the, the policy that already exists. The latter. Okay. Thank you. Ooh, thank you. Any other questions? All right, let's vote on the motion. Yes. Yes. Morales. Aye. Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. All right. Uh, we're on now to uh, open forum. Let's see if there are any members of the community who'd like to speak on any item which is not on the agenda. Mr. Beekman. Hi, uh, to speak on my public comment uh, at the end of yesterday, uh, I ran out of time again, <laughs> strangely. I was trying to comment that, uh, you know, uh, in this era of, of COVID-19, we've done a lot uh, before COVID-19 was taking place really good positive sustainability practices were taking place. Um, you know, the bike trail issues that are going on right now, uh, elect, uh, community electricity, uh, and even 4 and 5G were all programs. Uh, Councilperson Carrasco has mentioned before. I mean, 4 and 5G were issues that we were really trying to work towards really interesting good ideas and sustainable ideas. I think we proved, you know, from that time that uh, we were just simply building our good future and, and we didn't need, you know, all the social changes that can take place with COVID-19 uh, happening. We didn't need that social structure. We were doing just fine without it. 
we were building something really positive and hopeful. And I, and I just wanted to remind that uh, open public policy ideas that I work with, it, it totally works towards that as well. And, and for 4 and 5G to, to learn to work with that is really vitally important, I feel, in how to build our more decent future and how to get out of this situation of COVID-19 that has placed us in. Um, we are going to have to, uh, to conclude here, 25 seconds. I, I, I feel we're really going to have to be able to address uh, you know, the deep ramifications of what COVID-19 is, is, is how we, we have to address our society in the future. And, as, and like I said, you know, we have to address our social planning first, that we don't hurt each other when, when doing large scale social planning. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Soto. Uh, yeah, Paul Soto here. I would. I was extremely. I was sad. I was confused, and I really, I, I hadn't felt that excluded or left out since the time that I spent in prison. Today, I got the news that 150 million dollars is going to be allocated to nonprofits through the city and nonprofits. I was not included in that conversation. I was not included in one sentence of that conversation. And this is a rejection of my own city. But you would, it would be very rare to find someone that has such a rich legacy to the land. Is not my father pitching a tent on the, in, on the grounds that I have pictures of in Sasi Puedes enough to qualify me? Is not the 15 ancestors that every single one of them toiled under that which Google was acknowledging? Is that not qualification? I was excluded and I was left out. That in itself, is a moral and ethical issue with the city because I have proven to my city that I'm committed and that I spend 40 hours a week on these meetings, reading the memos, studying, doing my research, coming prepared, stay the whole entire meeting. And I've been doing it consistently for over two years. Nobody has that kind of knowledge that I have because I've been to every single one of the meetings, all the subcommittee meetings. And I was left out of that conversation. So introduce me to the person that is just as qualified or more qualified to have sat in that room. Thank you, Rowan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is a very small ask. Um, it's about closed captioning. I can get closed captioning on Granicus. I can get it on YouTube. But for some reason, the city is not enabling closed ca captioning on Zoom. And if they don't know how to do that, I suggest they reach out to MTC. We've been doing this for months now. The, the next thing moving on, and I think that would be a nice from the city, since we have got such a close uh, relationship with Zoom, is to ask them to reach out to Google and come up uh, with a way to translate the Cross captioning in real time in multi languages to address the equity issues we have got, you know, with uh, various uh, ethnic groups in the city. Uh, thank you, and I guess good evening or good night. Thank you, Mike Sutherland. Council members, I just want to make a very quick thank you um, as you drive by um, Fourth and Reed. Um, I just want to extend a huge, huge appreciation to uh, the city at love for making possible the move of the Pallison apartment building to the corner of 4th and Reed. Every time you uh, head south on 4th and you merge onto 280 North, I hope you'll pat yourselves on the back and um, accept our sincerest appreciation for all the help that we received from our city. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Stay healthy.